Hey everyone, I'm Jay. I'm Sophia. And I'm Fish Sticks. Welcome to Witches Betwixt. Hey, there's a new voice here. <laughs> Who is oh, it? Damn. It's I Fish. Mean... Um, Fish is a good friend of Sophia's. So Sophia, you want to take the floor and yeah. introduce your friend here? So my friend Fish here is somebody I met over on my DKMU server. That's right, we're bringing in more of us. And There's I've more, they're invading. Her... I've known her for a little chunk now, and she's just been, like, fast friends, thick as thieves with me, and I, I chat her up any chance I can get, because she's always, like, um, a good ear, uh, a compassionate listener, and a very insightful and funny fucking person, and I just kind of wanted to, like, pull you in so you could sit down and just pick your brain about magic and chat shit, you know, and shoot shit, you know? Hey, I'm excited. I'm really fucking flattered, so thank you. Yeah. Of course. You know? <laughs> okay and now we can just go back to our old conversation yeah. so kind of what we were talking about um we we tend to like chat a bunch before we are actually like recording the episode but i'm probably gonna pop some of that previous conversation in because that was really cool where you guys were yeah. going with that but basically for our kind of general topic today we were kind of just talking about you know just chaos magic the different theories of it and you guys were just running with it and fish i think you mentioned that you were you were working on a, a project that you're writing or something like that. Um, this is actually something that's kind of been sitting in the back of my head and taking up space for a long time. Mm -hmm. I, I've tried to write this a few times in the last 21 years. And what I always ended up in the past running into was that I, I thought that I had a broad enough understanding of what I was doing that I could explain it to other people. And then in the writing, I realized I fucking didn't. So <laughs> I just said, okay, I'm not going to be that, you know, that douchebag that writes a book about magic and, you know, proclaims themselves some kind of bullshit expert on this when I myself do not feel like I can properly explain it. Right. With and, like those books that come out with like no citations, no sources, just a bunch of stuff on paper. <laughs> Yeah, it's just basically somebody's schizonarrative that's been spat into a word <laughs> processor and then sold as the authority. Which, I mean, if you're going by the basic tenets of chaos magic, any paradigm, whether it has any factual basis at all or not, is valid. That's great. But then you have, like, big pockets of people who are like, this is the only way. Right. No one else knows what they're doing. And this whole current of, like, tribalism in magical practice that doesn't need to fucking be there you know wasn't so, uh, crowley like that in his writings i haven't read a lot of crowley but it wasn't crowley like notorious for that for his ego or like thinking like his way was the way it kind of depends on the year for crowley um mm. it started off like like his entire thing started off with you know i'm gonna get involved with the golden dawn i'm gonna get involved in this fraternal order and then he turned it on its fucking head because he did not like the way that they they carried themselves and he thought that they were you know they were really pompous and really cold and you know really sexless and really everything that alistair crowley wasn't i mean uh, fucking bram stoker was was a member of the golden dawn at that time wow um, i, I think william, that. william butler shit. yates and bram stoker and a, a number of other folks what? were a member of the golden dawn and he was just like fuck y'all i'm gonna go make yeah. my own fraternal order with blackjack and and hookers and, and thus the oto was born so i mean i, I don't want to diss my oto folks i mean it's it's kind of rad that such a widespread and well-known magical order came up out of that and, that's and it's, it's, crazy i'll tell y'all throw the best fucking parties just saying so <laughs> <laughs> you will not get fucked up party. as hard anywhere else as as you will at a lodge party uh. <laughs> man I gotta oh, find my God. local group then. Where y'all at? <laughs> <laughs> so well, you're in I, Philly, right? What me? Yeah. Yeah, I'm in Philly. I, so I, like, I, I imagine. I know there's, there's. We have a strong Masonic presence in Philly. It's not hard to find the Masons. Um, mm -hmm. but I don't I know about the there's gotta, be, there's gotta be something over there. Oh, for but sure. Anyway, we got all kinds of shit here. <laughs> <laughs> what were you saying, little fish? Oh, um, I was, I was just kind of circling back around, um, but like I've tried to write this thing a couple times and, uh, I think what I finally realized was that you don't have to 
no, like, like I, I have this, ang- I'm ADHD. So I have this anxiety about it being perfect. And if it can't be mm. perfect, there's no point in doing it. Mm. And that was kind of shotgunning me pretty bad. And what I eventually realized was that, you know, I don't have to know all of this shit. I'm just spitting out information and then providing this massive bibliography, which is already big. And I'm not even, I, I'm almost a fourth of a way through this. Right. And it's like, like, and and no one is all knowing, right? Like you could be practicing magic, you know, you could, you could, this could be like the day before you could be on your deathbed writing this, you know, you've attained all of the knowledge in your lifetime and you still wouldn't know everything. Like, and, and for yeah. people that would claim to know everything well then they know nothing you know what i mean like then don't even pay attention to them if they claim to know everything because it's impossible yeah i mean i distrust anyone who claims to be the ultimate fucking authority in in things related to you know the occult spirituality and magic in general like by the very nature of the 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 discipline if you want to call it that i mean you have to apply certain epistemology or other you know you 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 have to you have to apply certain concepts to it like the fact that we are immersed in this thing we are you know balls and and necks and eyeballs deep in this reality that we're participating in and because we are immersed in it we can't completely observe everything about it we have our own bias simply by existing as a part of it so like for somebody to say oh well this is the only way and this is the exact nature of this thing. It's fucking bullshit. Nobody can do that. If, if right. you were someone who was outside of our reality and not a part of this bubble of existence, this event in motion that we're a part of, you wouldn't be here proclaiming yourself to be an expert in the first place. You'd have bigger fucking shit to worry about. Yeah. So like... That's another thing, too, is like so much of what we rely on for our worldview is qualia which is a word for sensory input that's determined by your brain right it's just like fucking electrical impulses going through a meat suit and you're here interpreting it all and for anybody to try and like reduce their singular worldview as an objective truth is like completely missing the fact that they're relying on their like organic sensory input for all of that right and there's no I, two identical vessels like unless you're cloning people in a lab there's always going to be differences in people's experiences right and when you look at how just like reality is blurry you know like at a, at a subatomic level nothing even fucking touches and it's like constantly pushing each other back right and matter is like mostly empty but all you can ever feel is where the boundaries of everything is, right? Even if nothing touches, you can put your hand on something and get sensory information out of it. Like, what the fuck is that, you know? And then and then you're going to tell me that you could have your individual unique experience where you might be colorblind, you might not be, uh, and tell other people that your experience somehow is, like, the determining factor? It's absurd, you know? It is. It is. And I mean, what we are learning more and more every year as we as we advance in science is that reality is far more subjective than anybody ever fucking realized. So, mm-hmm. you know, I mean, and just brass tacks, like for folks that, that don't necessarily catch what's being said, think about it like pain tolerance. You know, somebody knocking their shoulder out of socket could be the worst pain they've ever felt in their life. For somebody else, they just knock it back in with a wall and keep going. I mean, Dude, that's how I are... felt about surgery. I had top surgery a couple of months ago and like it was Ooh. the worst. I've I never had surgery before. I never broke a bone. I never I've never severely injured myself in any way. I've never had surgery like that. I was miserable. Like I I retracted from the fucking world. But and yet I see a lot of other people, you know, they have that same exact surgery and they're like you know up and about three four days later walking around and i'm just like it's 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 amazing how people tolerate different levels of pain yeah i mean and it falls back to that concept of, of qualia and the whole one person's experience cannot be the authority of any given thing it's just what it seems like to them you know uh, it's i don't know just like i read magic books especially 
it, it wasn't as it, it's not as common now as it used to be but like in the early 90s when i was first like digging around trying to get outside of the bubble i had grown up in mm. uh, i would go and i would find these books and it was it was right around the time that new falcon publications quit publishing and i don't think i think wiser was still publishing at that point but not much and those mm. were probably two of the most academic of the large-scale publishers that existed and it was all llewellyn at the time oh yeah and everything was llewellyn <laughs> honestly a lot of it still is yeah unless you want to pay high fucking dollar Why yeah, wiser really um wiser is on the rise though if i had to say if anyone was gonna come close to maybe you know maybe i guess llewellyn's best competitor right now i think it might be wiser man i hope so yeah i, ju I tend to like them a little bit more than llewellyn no, no shade Honestly, on the Wellen though. They are the OG, so I can't really. They, think. they are the OG, and <laughs> they're they are in as much as they get shat on because so much of their stuff is just like, you know, meh. random random ass meh, you know, yeah. you know pagan stuff. With it's say. just really incredibly generic. A lot of it isn't nowadays, and they've and, and they've expanded their catalog a whole lot. Like actually, and um... honestly, that's not the shit on their early catalog. Like uh, one of the books that they wrote or they published way back was called The Twenty One Lessons of Merlin. Right, uh, I mean, like, they had what they had, you know? They could only pull from so many sources. And people were only yeah. producing so much content. Um, Actually, no, with, with Llewellyn, I know that Byron Ballard, um, she is um, an Appalachian folk magic witch down in um, Carolinas, I think. I can't remember which Carolina, but I think she's down there. Um, She actually has a book coming out through Llewellyn, which I thought was pretty damn cool, because that's all, like, yeah. folk magic, you know, real homegrown kind of stuff and i was like oh shit so very happy about that that llewellyn Absolutely. is branching out like it and it, it's interesting to see how they've evolved over the years because like I, I cite 21 lessons in merlin because it was sort of like a hermetic interpretation of reconstructed druidism because we don't know a lot about the druids we really don't like uh in the last i, I guess since the 60s and even before that like like there were there were early attempts to try and put together what the druids did shit. Yeah, um, we just do a lot of reconstructing of of bits and pieces of history. It's kind of what we've yeah, been doing. Yeah, it's okay as long as we're just fucking honest about it. You know exactly. Mm -hmm. There you go. Mm -hmm. Like, <laughs> but um, it was it was the first time I had seen like a, an idea of hermeticism or a sort of th thaumaturgic approach to it, as opposed to a highly belief based thurgic sort of pseudo worship approach to it yeah and that, that kind of hit me like I, I i i'm not a druid i'm not a pagan but but i really appreciated that book so yeah a lot of the magic books that were out in like those early 90s or not even early 90s that was too young for me but maybe even still into the early 2000s early yeah. 2000s it even was still very um worshipy kind of still it was very it was like a lot of magic books had a lot of dogma attached to them still yeah and i mean there's there's no less validity in kind of a thurgic point of view toward magic but i feel like i mean and, and i'm you know i'm one of the the lifers in the chaos current you know from from the z cluster on i feel like modern magic that used to be considered like results oriented magic or low magic i mm. guess if you want to you know pretend it's something it isn't yeah <laughs> like lends itself really well to a thaumaturgic or you know a pseudoscientific viewpoint and that might be in part because it fits better into the current consensus you know it it lends itself to people who might not have like some sort of rich cultural tradition mm -hmm. to fall back on and sort of understand by that lens you know they they read you know, uh, Scientific American. You know they right. they read National Geographic. They 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 know about psychology. They know about sociology, um, anthropology. So like, seeing that injected into what used to be considered a really deeply, I guess, religious practice is pretty rad. And I think that it that's part of the big appeal of it, and it's growing appeal. Like we've got the big pop culture or the pop magic movement now. Mm -hmm. And it's a lot of the same shit. It's sort of a, a logical outcome. 
Yeah, yeah and we did an episode on pop magic magic actually not too long ago, and um, I've been learning to read more with my um, cloud cards, and holy shit, they're fucking good. Like, pop magic can be really fucking fire, uh, despite it not being, like, a air quotations traditional magic. Like, it's it's definitely got a lot of validity in its actual technique and application. Yeah, we I mean, um we had I mean we do our own episodes on the yeah, like when the new Sabrina episodes come out we gotta have an episode on that stuff. Um, but we did actually it was another DKMU person, wasn't it? Um, <laughs> we're um I can't remember. Ursa. Welcome Ursa. Uh, Ursa is not a DKMU person, but they're DKMU uh, adjacent. Okay. So close enough. So <laughs> close enough. Um. So. Yeah, I mean that. Yeah, that was a really cool episode. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> I was just like, no, that was, yeah, that was a. Really, it was one of my favorite ones that we did. Um, it was really fun to do. Oh, it's rad that y'all that y'all cover it and you give pop magic time. I mean, it, 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 you you kind of see it in in the the broad spectrum chaos community where a lot of the older hands and the veterans and the graybeards are like. Uh, pop magic, blah blah blah, blah you know, and they, they really shit talk it because it, 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 there's this notion that, despite the fact that that they they study chaos magic, that they practice it and adhere to those concepts, that somehow these people, these young kids, you know, these these Gen Z and you know whomever else, that are recombining notions and concepts and then using them, putting them to use, is somehow a wrong application, which. Again, that's the kind of shit that shoots the chaos movement in the face. Mm -hmm. like, like we were all about that when we were their age. Why is it different now? Why are you Why are you looking at magic like you're a boomer? Like, can you not? <laughs> I guess inadvertently, people get old and get crusty and stuck in their their positions, and they kind of get that whole, "Oh, we've been doing this for longer than you've been alive. Who are you kids to come along and reinvent the wheel?" And it's like. That's the story of fucking history, man. It's the old people getting cut crusty, saying, who are you to challenge traditions? New people coming in and making shit that pisses off the old people. Rinse and fucking repeat, man. Sometimes I have my moments, though, I will admit. Like, some, I'll just, like, scroll past some, some probably usually in some stupid Facebook group, right? And I'm like, <sighs> rolls eyes, <laughs> continue scroll. <laughs> I have my moments <laughs> as I get old and crusty myself. <laughs> Honestly, I think that everybody is going to get that way, especially if that's something mm -hmm. they feel really strongly or mm -hmm. passionately about and have invested, you know, hundreds of thousands of hours into reading and writing about and discussing and learning. But that doesn't invalidate what these kids are doing. It really no, doesn't. not I at mean, all. It, I think... I, it, it's, it's easy to lose your temper sometimes, though, I gotta say. Mm -hmm. I, I think the funniest part for me is inadvertently getting put into the role of mentor when I didn't fucking ask for it and uh, I don't feel yeah. ready. And it's funny. Oh. And it's 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 karmic fucking justice because I see these young magicians and they're doing all this shit that pisses me off and it makes me so mad because that's exactly what I did when I was their age. And it's karmic fucking justice that I have to deal with that as an older person now and put up with the exact shit I put other people through. So I just grit my teeth and say, okay, let's 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 do this. I deserve this. Yeah, because what is it in like the oh, queer yeah. community is like if you're twenty five, if you're older than twenty five, you're an elder. That's oh, usually how it that. works. That's oh, just because man, we had that's, like a messy generation. Grim. It is grim. <laughs> it is grim, but... but that's also a byproduct of having a missing generation, right? Because yeah. We didn't necessarily have elders, and like having a lot of queers who are in their thirties to forties right now is kind of like a new generational thing that we don't even necessarily always think about because that is a scar that hit a generation that was above us, right? Like. Uh, my mentor who passed away this uh, summer uh, was part of the HIV generation, and they were really fucking lucky to not catch it. But, like, that devastated a lot of their friends, and that's something that we still kind of, like, miss the effects of to this day as young queers, right? Well, younger mm -hmm. queers, because, I mean, like, I'm over th I'm over 30. Um, uh, I'm not going to fucking out everybody else's ages. No, I'll, here, be, eight, I'll be 30. In our young 20s. I'll be 30 in <laughs> April on tax day, April 15th. When you file your taxes, think of my 30th birthday. Uh, <laughs> I turned 40 in May, and, like, it's... Yeah, see? Yeah. There you go. <laughs> so, that is one thing, like, um... I lived in an area 
before I, I live in Colorado now. But before I lived in a You really live in the well- the promised land of the legal weed. <laughs> uh, there are only certain parts of Colorado that are the fucking prom. Really? <laughs> yeah, I live in the equivalent of Florida man. Oh, Colorado. the bad part of Colorado. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah. No, go to the happy part. Go to the happy yeah, part. Yeah, I don't know the name of the city, but it's about an hour and 15 minutes south Oof. of Denver. <laughs> Ouch. So, like, I, I haven't been a part of the the. the broader lgbt community in a long time because the city that i lived in before this in another state i as as someone who's a lesbian leaning pansexual and before i knew what pansexuality was like back in the 90s like i was not very well educated about this shit i considered myself bisexual most of my relationships were women or with women i ended up marrying someone who at that time was incorrectly believed to be a male. And I don't was to, pansexual even a term in the nineties? I don't think so. I don't I don't think that started to come around until like mid two thousands. Yeah, I think it was either you were gay, bi or straight. They had like three options. Yeah. Well like I just didn't even know it was a thing. Um, right. But uh, pansexuals the, the the term has been around for a really long time. Like mm-hmm. it, it it was it was uh I think it was Sigmund Freud that came up with it. It was oh, early, in the, early in the 1900s. Really? Uh, yeah. Uh, I guess it just wasn't in popular use. Well, nobody really felt like they needed to use it. They might not have known about it. But right. um, to be someone who who identifies as you know lesbian and pansexual, who married what people will immediately assume is a man, you know, that, that puts you on the outer edge of the LGBT community already. Mm-hmm. And in the specific city that I was in, I wasn't just at the edge. It was made very clear that I wasn't fucking welcome. So Ugh. I just didn't really involve myself all that much because I don't need to take that kind of abuse from my own community mm-hmm. any more than I need to take it from anybody who isn't a part of it. So, There's so much of that in the community and it is infuriating. It is. It is. And now that, now that, my wife is out and and has kind of acknowledged and accepted and become willing to discuss and take action on the fact that they're a trans woman and have known since they were very small Mm. and have has, has felt unable to do it the the entire scenario is kind of turned on its head for me and the lgbt community and trying to judge whether or not getting involved in the LGB- LGBT community in a social aspect is actually safe for her. You yeah. know? That is very but, true. <laughs> like, I had no idea how many fucking turfs there were. <laughs> and, and, and the second that, that this, is, this is something that, that I'm involved in and aware of, it's, it's like I see them everywhere. It's like they're coming out of the fucking woodwork, and I'm embarrassed about it, and I'm mad about it. Mm-hmm. Right. yeah because you're like wait how are you in the same community that i'm in and you're saying what now it's like come on now we don't need that here yeah you're like get Seriously. out of here with all that noise it's it's i'm not going to compare the experience of of trans women dealing with turfs in the lgbt community to my own experience as you know that that dumb bi who decided they wanted to call themselves pan because supposedly, and this is something I've heard within the community, a pan is just a bisexual who wants to feel like a snowflake. Oh my Which that, god. That this... ain't fucking it. Like, it's not the same struggle, it's not the same situation, it's not the same level of, of, of hurt or trauma, but like, it's the same shit, it's just put on somebody else, you know? Mm-hmm. You know, I have mad for her. I had a friend give a really hot take about that, but uh, I kind of think they're onto something. They Mm -hmm. said, I think that all the people who say that they're bi just don't like how pansexual sounds. Hmm. Uh, Well, I mean, I delineate bisexuality and pansexuality for for some Mm -hmm. reason. Um, I feel like, and this is just my personal interpretation, everybody else is going to have their own. But the thing that seems to define pansexual as opposed to bisexual is that a pansexual legitimately, or at least usually, doesn't give a fuck. Mm -hmm. Like, 
you could identify as male, you could be, identify as female, you could identify as ND, you could identify as anything. I don't fucking care. We don't care. We don't, we, we just don't. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't have an expectation or a preference for the binary genders any more than anything else. Whereas the bisexuals seems to have a little bit more stress placed on preference for folks that resemble one of the binary genders. Mm. And that's I see not shit talking them at all. Like it's it's not. It's just that seems to be the differentiation between the two. No, I see what one you mean because you know, like if someone is like you know, they like they want their partner to be very male coded or female coded, not something in the middle. They're not comfortable with kind of the middle, maybe the in between. Well, that's what I was going to chip in about. Mm. Bisexual technically means more than one. It doesn't mean just two. Ah. So I know some people who specifically identify as bisexual or polysexual because they don't like to date cis men. That's the big discretionary point that I've always understood it as. If you're bisexual or polysexual, you're not necessarily attracted to all genders, but you're attracted the, to more than two or more at least, right? Mm. So. That's essentially what I took out of it. And that's the, the fun part about identities. Like if you're more comfortable with polysexual, pansexual, or bisexual, you're free to identify as any of those, right? And that's also kind of the beauty of the word queer, even though it's not always as reclaimed in every community and in every right. um, category, but it, it depends, right? We so. use it pretty inclusively. We, we've really reclaimed that term here on, on the mm -hmm. podcast for sure. We, I mean, it's like in the title, oh, Queer Witchcraft Podcast, so, <laughs> you know. <laughs> but I mean, like, I'm the, I'm the last person to, like, fucking gatekeep, and I'm not saying that this is the hard line of what is what. Like, this right. is just, as I said, it's a my theory. personal interpretation of the of words themselves. And everybody is allowed to interpret them however they want, and anybody can identify however the fuck they want that is their right and that is absolutely important for them to know and do and i feel anybody like who tells them they fucking can't or gatekeeps it yeah fuck those people i feel like uh <laughs> so many fucking twitter arguments could be ended if people just took that take on a discussion right Holy like fuck, right? <laughs> we can give three different fucking opinions well my interpretation is this and mine is this and mine is that and then they're like but it just seems like online someone has to win someone has to be right it's like well you're all right and we're all wrong how about that Yo, <laughs> nobody wins i don't want to I want to circle that back to the magic discussion, though, because that isn't just a thing about online. That is a thing about, like, human nature and society and, like, magical yeah. discussion, which really that is, fucks me that up. That really happens yeah. in magical yeah. The way I grew up, it it's not about, like, w the way I grew up, your idea isn't you or whatever. So if someone's like, I don't like that opinion, they're not attacking you or, like anything they're just saying i don't like that idea and it's kind of like you can bring it up to talk about it and you talk about the ideas not about the people behind the ideas taking it as like a personal attack right and it like in in witchcraft communities uh it, it's really exacerbated i think by online presence you know but like you see it everywhere whether it's tradcraft whether it's in wicca servers whether it's in like even our own servers uh, in the the chaos magician circles like you get people who like really um take their personal experiences and their opinions as just like so much more fucking important than everybody else's and i just don't get it you know yeah and, and i sometimes i wonder about that so if we go by the idea that a magician and their interaction with reality and their interface with reality is at least in part fed by their belief and their confidence in what they are doing Part of me wonders when you, we see these people, and it, you're right, we see them across the board. They are, mm -hmm. even in the chaos magic community, which is paradoxical as fuck to me, but then again, we can be. But, like, part of me wonders if, if that's part of their, an important part of their specific meta narrative, their internal narrative that keeps them afloat as magicians and keeps them functional. They have to, in some way, and they might understand this consciously, they might have to insist that their way is the only way, that their observations are the most accurate. Because if they acknowledge that it's a purely subjective phenomena and that they are not some manner of authority on the matter, their magic and their ability to interact with reality on that level might take a hit. 
So I, I yeah. wonder sometimes if these people actually are like drinking the Kool-Aid of their own hype or if they are working within that internal narrative and trying to preserve it. I'm never really quite sure. And honestly, I, it, it's not important either way because they're doing it. But And see, I've seen flips of both, right? Because I've had times where somebody like tries to not even necessarily assert that I should believe their their beliefs, but they try and like state their stuff so hardly that it's almost like they're stating it like it's objective truth you know like when people come in and say well you know spirits do this you know like it's 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 kind of like there's this weird there's a weird balance to it right and some people really kind of push it without noticing necessarily that they're doing that and I guess anybody can do that even even myself or anyone really because that's just part of human nature but it really comes down to the fact that like when people check you about it, how you respond is a big deal, right? And on the flip side of that, the other thing that comes into my mind is like, there's very much a struggle for power in a lot of magicians' minds, I think, where if they give away their power to somebody else and think of somebody else as higher than them or knowing more, it deflates that mage ego, which they need for the process of working. And so, like you talk about how we kind of do need to cultivate a deliberate mage ego for the purpose of doing magic and these acts. And you have to believe that you can move mountains to actually move mountains, but people aren't necessarily able to step outside of that ego when the work is done. Right. And how it really kind of bleeds over. And I, and I think that's kind of the crux of what goes on is people don't know how to cultivate the mage's ego without it being in opposition to the people around them rather than treating them like peers or people on the same team, you know? Yeah. And honestly, like a lot of people get drawn into magic and into magical communities on a social level because they want, number one, to feel like they belong somewhere. Oh, yeah. And in part, some of them, and I'm not saying all of them or even the majority of them, go because they want to feel important, even among their own group. And that's something we see across the board in, you know, non, non-occult related things at all. It could be, like, the ladies' bingo night. You know, it could be uh, 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 dudes at the Jungian Society writing a thesis about, about noetic mm-hmm. magic or, you know, psychology. It's something that happens everywhere. It's just especially obnoxious to us in our community because we feel like we need to be better than that. And really, we do. Um, And also, (laughs) when you're like... Sorry, not to cut you off, but it's also like when you're you're trying to work with something that's so um, wishy-washy like magic, it's not like it's a hard science like doing fucking physics, right? So that's what makes it especially troublesome in this field is it especially exacerbates that problem, you know? There's so much room for somebody to just claim whatever wild outlandish bullshit they want and have it feed into their own personal psychosis, you know? It, it, that is a problem. Honestly, like, I, if I could change the view regarding, and, and this is, I'm not trying to make this a DKMU-centric conversation, but I, I work from that example we're basically unofficially <laughs> affiliated with the dkmu God, how <laughs> officially you know, unofficially our, our adjunct yeah <laughs> we're all part of the same nebulous thing but um... it all comes back to turtles it's turtles all the way down and all the way up <laughs> all the way down but like when i when i come at dkmu and this is the way that i always sort of viewed it whether it was something deliberately cultivated by you know the founders or not um, I come at it like a magical peer group, like we are pseudo academic in what we're doing. We are a group of people who study and work and research and practice and explore the same discipline. And we all have our own unique lens on it. We all have our own pet projects and our own research, our own opus that we're building. We're not in chaos magic. It's never a collaborative fucking effort. Everybody has their own research that they're doing, their own line of thinking, their own tech that they're working on building or, ex- or you know, experimenting with. And we are all basically part of the same research body, but we all have our own specialties and we all have our own observations and our lens for observing it. So when you go at conversations like that, you, you need to go at it as though you are discussing this with someone who is a peer. Like, 
in an academic way, a fucking peer. And that's something that you see in the parapsychology community. I'm not talking about like dip fucks on TV with a, you know, with a night vision camera running around going, <laughs> oh, I'm so startled. Ghost <laughs> like, like Ghost when, you're, when you're going into like hardline parapsychology, like, and, and this is something that I, I was a part of in college and a little bit after college, it, the way that you have to approach other parapsychologists and other research bodies is to say, these are our observations. These are our results. This is our data. And we're presenting this information and we might individually have some theories about why this works. We might've come up with a big broad scale theory, but like anything else in academia or science or pseudoscience, if we don't want to use that as a, as a, you know, a diminutive term or a fucking denigrated term, but like, you know, you present this as a theory, you know, it's, it's something that might be true. The, the research you have right now points to being true may end up not being i mean you basically use the sci the basic scientific method in magic anyway it's, that's essentially what you're applying to, to magic studies this basic yeah. scientific theory is i have a hypothesis that if i do this it will produce this result oh exactly. it there's didn't the, okay the i have to change xyz term. there's a specific term for that actually in dkmu um hmm. there's a magician who came up with a formula vincent grasmick and it's yeah, the Grassmick method, and it's pretty much essentially like that, where um, if you want to actually um, prove and verify your results, you have to essentially utilize the scientific method uh, in application to your magic. And, and I think uh, I remember I, I reading that in one of mm -hmm. the... I've been reading some of the DKMU stuff that's on the website. Yeah, I think you one of the... together with the fucking I did. steel rib the things like we use <laughs> the binder the clips. Champion. Yeah, <laughs> like and the Grassmick method, uh, and and I I I love Vincent Grassmick. Uh, I we might not see eye to eye on politics or literally anything else, but like in my lurking in DKMU <laughs> over the years and reading his work and reading you know the discussions that he had during his deeper involvement, like I can't say that there have been many folks in DKMU that seem to have the same viewpoint that I do mm -hmm. as closely as Grassy did. Mm. And, and his, his method of documentation, it's sort of streamlining and, and helping to perfect at least for our specific paradigm or meta paradigm, honestly, the, the concept of the magical journal, like, and that's what that's what the magical journal was always supposed to be about. You know, you're recording your observations, you're recording the rituals you did, your, your <laughs> weird ass spiritual little vibes, your moments of synchronicity or seriality or syn you know anything like that, any strange happenstance to try to make sense of all of it. Um, and that's what it was supposed to be in the first place. He just sort of formalized it in a way that made it easier to understand and kind of pointed out the actual purpose. You know, it's not just for broody little you know, broody little rants about this, that, or the other, or, you know, it can, it, it can be, obviously, but, like, <laughs> what about self-inflated musings and plans to save the world? Well, that's Big Toe. That's Big Toe. <laughs> right up. Oh, damn. For those of y'all who don't know, Big Toe uh, is something we mentioned on DKMU before that's essentially, like, coded magical speech, where you talk about something by not talking about it, and it's um a seldom understood method, um, like, a lot of people can be really direct in their approach where they'll say something that's pretty much exactly what they mean, but that's, like, uh, not necessarily traditional big toe. Traditional big toe, a classic quote is, these kids don't know shit about my Bombardier. <laughs> Shut up and drink your great juice. Yeah. You fucking <laughs> yelling, Jesus Christ, drink your fucking juice. <laughs> fucking love you, oh my god. Oh my god! But yeah, it's it's that, that's that's straight up big toe. That's grist for big toe. So. Uh, what I what I could do if if one of you would be willing, find me a like a written sample. I could pop it in the uh, the show notes for anyone who's yeah. interested. I'm sure we can find you some. some oh well, we'll go digging. Hell yeah. We have like years and years worth of people just fucking shit posting on their on big toe. So don't Honestly, you even I write I write garbage big toes because like I. I, I can I can't make it organic. I can't mm -hmm. I can't give it that life and I don't know why. I think it's just because like I, I write for a living and 
Maybe I, what you do, just get really yeah. drunk. That's oh, hold up. You read my fucking mind, man. I would feel like <laughs> most big toe is actually really written when somebody is incredibly inebriated or uh, hallucinating. Like most original big toes, I'm just gonna let y'all in on a secret. Was usually people just typing jibber jabber when they were really fucking it's almost like stream of consciousness like mushrooms are yeah, yeah. 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 And, yeah and it's it's stream of consciousness yes that a person interprets through context and knowledge like drink your grape juice is like youngins is basically like holy shit these kids need to fucking just like drink a little bit chill out and grow the fuck up and actually do some fucking magic for once and actually like do this shit and you know like uh that's kind of actually what it means and these yeah. kids don't know shit about my bombardier is talking about somebody actually being so fucking high <laughs> and nobody knowing that their balls <laughs> rip high on, on whatever they're on right and that's what those two quotes come from they're, that's they're just great completely veiled meanings right so you're not supposed to necessarily make it uh directly tangible it's supposed to be inferred from the knowledge between you and the parties you're speaking it to and that's why it's not like a true ciphered coded system and it's impossible to crack if you're somebody who's an outsider you have to have in-group knowledge to understand big toe but the best part about that even if it's just something that is is encoded in, in some abstract intangible fashion if you hand a chunk of big toe to someone who has nothing to fucking do with it and and they are looking for some specific piece of information or the right words to describe something or a concept that you know that they've been aching to try to figure the fuck out you hand them some completely unrelated big toe and there's a good chance that they'll see a, at least a few words in a string that make fucking sense to them. i it just doesn't, it am, doesn't make sense in its origin <laughs> i am i am living proof of that because i um i'm in the dkmu channel and i you know kind of lurk around there and Sophia had kind of mentioned Big Toe before, but like you didn't really go into exactly what it was. You were just like, it's it's a made up language thing. And then the, you didn't really say much more on it. And I was like, okay. So I was reading, you know, they have a channel in there. I think that's where I was reading it. Mm -hmm. But yeah. Um, <clears throat> and I was just in there reading some of it. And even, and I was like, okay, this is definitely like someone's high as fuck and they're just yammering away on the keyboard, you know? Yeah. Um, and but it was it was cool though you know to see it's almost like a, it was a snapshot into whatever that person's mind was doing at that it's, point in time and i've definitely pulled some inspiration or like you said like a concept or just something it's like the concept of the cut up if you if you if you know anything about like early or earlier practices in chaos magic like you think think Ostnos and spar and william burroughs and mm -hmm like early, early founders of what would eventually become the, the chaos magic current. Uh, Cut-ups were a fucking thing. And it's kind of like, Victo is sort of like a cut-up, except it's not done physically. It's just, it, it's done as a result of being massively fucking drunk and or high and or cross mm -hmm. and sort of putting the concept that you're, you're trying to describe through a series of abstractions that sort of equate to a cut-up. That's sort of what it is. It plays on some of the same concepts and notions. So, like, it's 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 ultimately Sense. incredibly useful. I mean, there are going to be times when you glance at Big Toe and you're like, oh my god, that is incredibly cringe. But then you give it a second read and you're like, holy fuck. All right. And then you give it a third read and you're like, oh, that's still cringe. Yes. <laughs> I mean, it, can, it can be cringe as fuck and still have, you know, kernels of kernels of absolute mm -hmm. beauty. It can be a fucking diamond, it, you know, embedded in a turd, but, like, yeah. So maybe like you know, it's almost like a a Hemingway kind of situation, like right drunk, but don't yeah. never edit sober. Just leave it there and never look at it again. <laughs> you just write yeah. it and forget about it. <laughs> just dump it out into the universe and just say, kind of "Fuck it, it's there yeah. now." Yes. Oh my god! Absolute conversation. <laughs> and then I start I start reading like um, this is book shit um. I was working on trying to find the most concise, most, and, and this is a problem I have with, with magic books. Okay. So many people who write magic books and write, write theories and articles about magic work really, really, really fucking hard to be cryptic and vague 
and artful. They want to be that great master. They want to be that mystical teacher. They want to be that big, bad, double Crowley, you know. <laughs> and, 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 and they just can't fucking say what they mean. And that makes me angry. Mm -hmm. Angry. So I, I want to try to write things with technical art. And, and, and you know, put that fucking BA in English and lit theory to use. And write it with technical art, but don't make it so up its own ass that you have to sit there and try to figure out what the fuck I'm saying. I say mm -hmm. what I'm saying, <laughs> you know. And when I was trying to sit down and, and write out synchronicity, as Jung explained it, it was really hard to come up with something that didn't either sound like I was, you know, a member of the, you know, the big scary, non-existent dollar store Black Lodge, <sighs> or I was writing a site manual. So like. I decided to dig a little further back, and uh, one of my friends was a retail. I think you were there for that conversation on me. Uh, I think it was yeah. retail. Uh, mentioned Kammerer and his theory of seriality, which predated Carl Jung's concept of synchronicity. And I started reading into Kammerer, trying to figure out how I could explain this in, in a way that stood between the two and made sense and was not difficult to understand or required any external interpretation. Problem is, Kammerer's work was never translated out of fucking German, so mm -hmm. that's been a journey. Um, but it, I, I wish that, and, and there's a time and a place for for flowery writing. There's a time and a place for writing these beautiful, profound pieces of prose related to magic. And I like that DKMU has a place for that shit, but they don't mm -hmm. take it too seriously. You know, it's all written. It, 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 no matter what you read from DKMU, it's it's always going to be it, it, it. There's always going to be a grin to it. There's always going to be this acknowledgement of yeah, this is some magasitis bullshit right here. But <laughs> let me give it to you. We both understand what ex what this is. <laughs> we ain't pretending about it. Let me write you some beautiful shit that will inspire you. And there's there's a place for that, but they don't fall through, like I say they because I always think about. I always think about the fact that I'm I'm the Z that migrated over. I was one of the youngest mm -hmm. Zs, and now I'm one of the oldest fucking marauders. So, like, it, it's always like, oh my god, y'all are doing so good. I'm so excited. Holy shit, y'all are awesome. <laughs> it's like we, and it really is a we, and it's been a we for over over thirteen, fourteen years now. Like we we understand, and we don't take it too seriously. We don't take ourselves too seriously. And when we notice that one of our number does take themselves too fucking seriously, we all make it a point. You put them in oh, check. <laughs> like, well, it is not mean-spirited or anything. It isn't. Like, we don't just, like, chew each other up like a bunch of assholes. But, like... No, just like, a gentle yeah. reminder. You're being a dick. Well, <laughs> Your ego is to... filling the room. <laughs> we'll actually pull each other aside and be like, look, what the fuck is up? Or, or like, hey, I noticed you're going through some shit and you're like acting it a little bit more like we're we're usually like really compassionate about each other about it because we're like a peer group but also kind of like a, a group of really close friends you know like a lot of people in there are are people who would straight up travel to go meet or live with other people in the group at different points not everybody has that level of um emotional involvement with other people in the group and it's not required to work with us but like there are people who like met their their life partners through the group you know and it's it's uh, interesting like that because there's people all over the fucking world in there you know like we have dkmu latin america is another really prominent group and they made like hexorius the the god form that's going on right now in the uh marathon progression which um i'll give a very short blurb about that every so often as a group we invoke all of our god forms uh one by one in progression from start to finish to produce a very specific set of results for some people it's familiarizing yourself with the current for the first time for old fags like myself it's usually to go over the old points to make sure that you remember your shit and you're not crusty and very often it's like riding a bike and remembering a bunch of stuff that you forgot and then um in this version we're doing new tech as well so we're running the second wheel which is stuff that we've uh been developing to see how that goes so um yeah hexorius is a pretty fucking sweet god made by uh dkmu latin america so like i don't know it's it's uh 
it's really interesting you know you never know what you're gonna get or who, who you're gonna meet or where you're gonna go with it right and um back to the topic of fucking meiji go another thing that pisses me off with books is like those arrogant fucking made uh or sorry author introductions you know when Holy it's like fuck. yeah oh, i have done this and this and this and this and this and this and oh, i was backpacking through delhi i was backpacking through delhi and <laughs> i had a, a form experience in a tea house surrounded by these these gurus and i sat among them and oh, and yeah it just like fucking, fucking and you're like way. you're like eat pray love blow me i don't care <laughs> i know right but it's like that's fucking fascinating but did you have to introduce your book with this shit this is just like some self-masturbation give me mm-hmm. what you observe give me your understanding and how you came to it don't give me like this folkine-esque fucking 30 page introduction about how you met and, and and how you met these gurus and you backpacked across you know south asia and and india and all these places and this weird leper you crossed on the road said that that <laughs> profound thing to you that changed your fucking life like, like give us the little bitty bits give us the cliff notes but don't like detail out what you ate that day and right. how greasy your shit was afterward i don't care <laughs> Uh, like, <laughs> yeah. seriously though no i feel like that because like <laughs> i really just at this especially at this point in like my guess my magical study like when i pick up a book i'm okay with like a very short intro chapter fine give me your little background it's cool fine but then i really just want to jump into it after that like i'll give you like maybe four pages to yeah, talk like, about you like, give me give me your bias give yeah. me how you see everything Oh yeah. You know, give me your bias, but don't 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 inflate it. Don't fluff it up. Right. I don't That's that. such a good way to put it. Don't give me your fucking credentials. Give me your biases, right? Mm-hmm. Like yeah. I wanna know the the shit that you're 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 already working for your models so i know what you're already going to use your confirmation bias with admit your shortcomings like go ahead and say like like what? One of my favorite we objects. should start making um like badges for all your different like paradigms that you subscribe to Ooh, like little pokemon God. badges <laughs> and then you just kind of open your jacket you know so, let me see your let me see your biases and you just whoop, and... <laughs> No, no. Oh my god. Like, this invites this invites some marauder probably to make an egregore devoted to showing up when somebody tries to, you know, invoke random ass spirit that they don't recognize and scream, You not possess enough gym badges. <laughs> like that that shit. that's the kind of shit that a marauder would do. <laughs> so don't, don't put that idea in their head, even if I did <laughs> But yeah, like give me your biases. Give me give me your lens on it. But if if you're if you're spending thirty pages inflating what you have done and trying to give me the impression that you are some kind of authority and that this isn't just your personal theories on paper and in print, I don't know. You're feeding into all the bullshit that I don't really care for. So mm-hmm. you know, the and one I mean, of... there's no way to verify any of it. That's right. the other thing. Like it's the same concept of on the internet. Nobody knows you're a dog. In a magic book, <laughs> nobody knows you're full of shit. So, like, I don't know how much oh, of it is real. <laughs> I don't know how much you might be misremembering or that was conjured up out of that weird-ass DMT trip from the from the shit you took up in your kitchen. I don't know. <laughs> you know? So, Tell me about fuck. your self-transforming machine elf experience. I will say, <laughs> I will say, one of my favorite garbage i guess okay so at this point there we have garbage occult books right so it's almost like we have uh it's like our trashy romance novels you know like Uh that like (laughs) your your guilty pleasure you know (laughs) mine is still and forever will be the satanic bible by levey i just that thing is just so funny to me like he is so full of himself He's a horrible human being. Let's just, I mean, he's a horrible human being, but God, it's just, it's so amusing to, to, to see how much he loves himself. <laughs> Boy, he did. He did. Man, fucking satanic Bible. Um, yeah, he needs to, uh, holy shit. But on the flip side, a modern day writer that is actually, um, she's great. She, she usually writes about like traditional witchcraft. It's kind of like her, her thing. 
Um, but she doesn't lay it on thick about, you know, my this, my that, my blah, 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 um, is Lara Tempest Zakroff. So anything really written by her, she takes a really casual approach um, to her writing. She doesn't claim to be this, like, you know, all-knowing or not even not even like a shred of, like, pompousness kind of thing in the writing. It's it's really good. It's, it's almost like um, the way she writes, it's almost like she's sitting down and she's having a conversation with you. Like you're having a conversation over coffee. And it's it's a really nice writing style. So if you want to check out those, I absolutely, absolutely recommend them. Absolutely. You know, I would love I... to pick her brain because um, I can't say too much, but I am pretty sure she knows about DKMU at the very least and may have had a hand in doing some shit with it. So I would like to ask her some questions one on one. That'd be Yeah, and she's super chill. So I'm like I have a pr I've I'm like Facebook friends with her, so I'm sure we could probably reach out at some point. Yeah, I'll and give her a read. Like <laughs> like if I'm going to like when someone shows up and they've gotten they've gotten kind of a, a thread of the current and they're starting to try to get information. They show up in DKMU because of synchronicity and happenstance. And they don't know dick about it. Mm -hmm. What I'm going to recommend to any of them, there are two books that I will, by default, fucking recommend. That is Condensed Chaos by Phil Heim, because Phil Heim, it, it, and if we're using the you know the metaphor of what it's like to read that book, reading Phil Heim, specifically Condensed Chaos, but basically everything else, is like sitting at a bar next to a dude you just fucking met, who is driven to tell you some profound, absolutely, absolutely profound, mind-blowing shit while he's half drunk and, you know, continuing to order more shots. You know, he's, yeah. he's that, that stranger at the bar <laughs> who is going to impart this knowledge on you, whether you need it or are ready for it or not. Like, you're ah, getting it. You know. Like, it's conversation. It, it's conversation, but it's also with a purpose. Uh, another one that I'll recommend to anybody is uh, Postmodern Magic by Patrick Dunn. Uh, that's a concise ass piece of work. It's a good introduction. I know a lot of people in the chaos community, specifically a lot of the older hands, dislike the term postmodern magic. But honestly, that's what chaos magic is. It's a postmodern occult movement. And it's part of that broad spectrum. And Pat Dunn applies the concept of chaos theory, the concept of treating magic like an operation within reality, treating it like a science instead of a religion, and looking at the underlying theories by which this shit works. And it's a good book. It's a great book, especially for a beginner. But another one that I will recommend is, is Quantum Sorcery by Dave Smith. That's written like a fucking thesis. And he is one of the authors, one of the few occult authors, that will update his books according to what he understands. He's about to have his, like, uh, I was talking to him, not long ago, and he mentioned that he had just sent in a new draft to be looked at. And oh, uh, so it's kind of like a textbook. Yes, it, it it has a it it's a it's absolutely a fucking textbook. It's That's what's quantum up. physics and quantum theory as it applies to magic within that paradigm, and that fucking Shit. speaks to me. And it has spoken to me from the moment I found it. Which I want to say that he put his first draft out in the late nineties at some point because I found it on the Z cluster. But man, that was fucking mind blowing. And also, fucking social media nowadays. That was not a thing when mm. I was growing up. Like, True. I hate to be the, the old bag here, but, like, I was born in 81. We right. didn't have cell phones. We didn't have social media. Social <laughs> media was, like, secretly passing a note across class to that kid you like. And then and, 10 years and, later, we were born. Man, and everything's <laughs> on the internet, and you can meet all your fucking Well, heroes. actually, I, I will say, so when we were born, so I always say, like, the people that were born in the early 90s, we kind of had both. Because we had like that late 80s upbringing still because we got it from our parents, you know, yeah, like siblings yeah. and stuff. And then like, and then all of a sudden, I want to say it was like mid 2000s, technology fucking exploded. And like, it exploded and it became affordable for everybody. That's yeah. Like yeah. cell phones were a thing for a long time and you could get like bag phones for your car and all that shit, but they were yeah. prohibitively expensive. But like 90s, early 90s kids kind of shared that same that same transition like uh, yeah i'm i i i was born 81 i'm not a gen xer i'm mm -hmm. too young to be a gen xer but i also am one of the oldest millennials around right and there's there's been this concept of a micro generation between the two called zennial 
mm. and it's character like the Oregon Trail generation, like the ones who had an analog childhood that they had a digital adulthood. Yeah, like I didn't have a cell phone until I was in college, and that was in the mid two thousands. My mother had one of those first initial like cell phones that could run for maybe thirty fucking minutes, and had <laughs> no signal at all. My dad had a bag phone in his truck, Ugh. like, and it was I'm super big expensive. To someone to death with. Yeah, right. My first modem was a gigantic cradle that you had to put your landline phone into and listen to robots be murdered to contact the internet, <laughs> which, which was not the internet as you know it. It was dialing into a computer somewhere else. Oh, boy. Yeah, if, uh, if your mom wanted to take a phone call, you had to get the fuck off the internet. Yeah. Uh, and then came... you had to be one of the lucky ones that had a, had a, a line in your room, which who the fuck did? Yeah, I did not. But my parents, I think my parents caved and they just got a second phone line. So they had like a, a dedicated internet line and then a dedicated phone line. That's what a lot of businesses had to do is they had the home phone number. But if you were broke like we did, uh, you had to get off the phone. Lower income. <laughs> we had to we had to share the, the the phone line with the internet. And people are like hearing this right now. and They're like, what the fuck kind of cave society did you live in? <laughs> We did. We lived in caves and dinosaurs roamed the earth. Yes. I mean, yes. I, I learned to shoot a gun when I was five years old, and I learned how to set steel traps when I was eight. So, like, I guess and we, we kind of fucking And we did, walked didn't to we? school in the snow uphill both ways for five miles. You know, carrying all of our books. And yeah. Little crust of bread we got to eat all day in a bucket. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. No. And if that weren't bad enough, too, we also had to deal with fucking deadly animals in my hometown that might follow you home after school. So you had to watch out in the bushes for fucking mountain lions. No Actually, joke. it's funny. Like, Sophia's upbringing is probably the closest to that, like, trope. Oh, you seriously? Like, and this, is why, this is why Sophia and I get along, because, like, uh -huh. I grew up in the rural fucking city. Oh, okay, like, okay. Like, think about, the, think about the Piney Woods, which is sort of that northeast corner of Texas the uh, northwest corner of Louisiana and then a bit of Arkansas. Like, think straight oh, up okay. Vanderland and then go 40 miles further in. Oof. And that's where I grew up. Like, I didn't, we didn't buy meat from the grocery store our entire year, you know, aside from like somebody needing to go to work every day and go to school every day. Most of our year was, was dictated by what hunting season it was and what needed to be harvested off of bushes or trees or dug out of the ground or shot and, and deal dressed and butchered and packed. Oh, so you, you know, lived was... pretty um subsistence lifestyle. She, she yeah, my grandparents a lot more than I did. Mm. My grandparents still live subsistence and they're I think my my father's parents are a little past ninety now. And honestly I, I think that subsistence, although it's been hard on them because, you know, they have scars and, mm -hmm. and wrinkles and shit, they're in better health than anybody that they know or are the same age as around mm. them like they they are as mentally competent and physically fit and healthy as someone 20 years younger and i think part of that has to do with the fact that they're not eating like like shit uh, from stockyards yeah, it's and all natural meat processing plants you know and yeah. i'm not one of those people who's like oh, gmo bad or mm, meat processing bad but it definitely isn't the greatest thing in the world. definitely the something there being healthy yeah, yeah. And I mean, it's good to know those things. It's just super weird when you're talking about your childhood to somebody who grew up in the city, like my wife. Uh, mm. and, and, you know, be like, well, you know, this, that, and the other. And I, 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 I can't imagine eating snake. And you're like, no, no, snake's awesome. You just have to get used to eating it off of itty bitty bones. <laughs> no, no, it's oh, great. God. You deep fry it. You, you cut it up and you, you dry the meat with a paper towel and you salt it. And then you, you roll it around and dredge like, cornmeal or some shit and deep fry it it's delicious you know and, and they're like what the fuck <laughs> you know? well i wouldn't know the first thing about how to survive you know in the wild or something i don't know how to field dress something i'm like okay here's how you do this <laughs> and just to everybody at the dinner party being like what this is horrible you how know? to scare city folk 101 let me dang. tell you what dang <laughs> then you become dang <laughs> Like, like you become the token Cajun, which is kind of what I am. So. <laughs> yeah, now we're starting to talk about background. Yeah, I've worked so really hard to get it out of my voice, but it's there. Uh, Sophia can confirm. 
I mean, it comes out at different times. It's like my native accent. You don't necessarily hear it when I'm talking like this, but Jesus Christ, you get me around Tyler or get me watching like native memes and I'll just fucking immediately start doing it again. Just like that. Or if I'm near my brother or uh, my dad too long, it'll fucking, it'll just start going right, right out. You know, there's, Honestly, there's almost no way to stop it. The, the problem, and this is part of why I got rid of this part of my voice. This is part of why I groomed this out of my voice completely is that when you leave that area of Texas or when you leave that area of Louisiana and you start talking to people, they hear this accent and they think that you are a fucking idiot, no matter what you say or how you say it or who you know or what you study. They're always going to talk to you like you're fucking five, no matter what. So, of course, when I started going to college or when I even when I moved out of that area in high school, I started working on trying to become as neutral sounding as I could, because like the last thing I wanted is to be the one who was thought of as not only that weird ass ADHD bitch in the back who likes girls, but also an, an idiot. Like It is a big fucking deal, though, like for real, if I don't talk in this specific cadence here that I've developed when I'm at work, sometimes people think I'm stupid and incompetent. They won't trust tasks to me because they don't think I understand what they're saying. Sometimes if I just say the words, how's it going quick enough or fast enough, like, how's it going? They don't even know what the fuck I'm saying. And they'll be like, excuse me. And I'll be like, how's it going? And they're like, what are you saying? I'm like, how's it going? And then they're like, oh, all right. And you have to kind of like not talk how you were raised because people, they're just not kind to it. And there's this real big bias that people from small towns or rural areas are fucking stupid because of how we talk and tropes on TV. And it's a total fucking disservice to people to cut them down like that and to disregard them just based off of like context. Like I remember one time I was hanging out with my ex-girlfriend and we were watching a show and uh, it, it was like farmers. It was on uh, Love, Death and Robots. If you've seen that, it's That's a good show. Farmers. Yeah, the farmers with the mechs, right? Yeah. And, uh, the the girl made this shitty comment. She's like, as if these rednecks are going to be smart enough to make that shit. And, I'm like, and I immediately said, you'd be damn surprised at how smart rural folk are if you actually <laughs> were to talk to them. Oh my like, gosh. I, I know, I know yeah. rural folk who you would look down on who could fucking just do all kinds of things with machines that you wouldn't even fucking imagine. Don't you even, you know what I mean? I have so, to, I have to, um, say, um, cause you, you mentioned the term redneck and I, I will say we had a, a couple of years ago when we had Byron Ballard <clears throat> as our, uh, guest, our speaker at Pagan Pride for Philly. Um, uh, I think Rob, he was president at the time and he was, he sent me like, he sent a message to her like, oh, this is the name of your workshop, right? And it said, uh, it's a, it was supposed to be Hill Folks Hoodoo, something, something, whatever it was. And I think his phone autocorrected it to Hillbilly Hoodoo. Oh, and, no. <laughs> oh man. And he sent it to her. And I was in this group chat. And she just very gently was like, oh, it's, um, it's, it's Hill Folks, not Hillbilly. And he was like, I am so sorry. I did not mean that. <laughs> man gonna start a war he didn't even realize he was gonna start <laughs> she was cool about it though and i was like oh my god bro yeah the appalachia's what the, App the appalachia hoodoo traditions are way different yeah. from every other, every other one of the sort of redneck cajun adjunct hoodoo traditions and 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 that's not to devalue like louisiana hoodoo it's not involved with the cajun community at all it is creole but it's still kind of, you're going to start a fight there. You didn't know. Yeah, Appalachia is its very own little pocket, which is why I actually really want to get my hands on her uh, new book. Hell yeah. That's not, that, I'm, I'm, I'm very excited about that. Like, mm -hmm. but like uh, with Sophia, it, I mean, you've got, at least in media, some of the, the concept of the Canadian redneck. I don't know what, what Canadian oh, call themselves. Fuck. The like, thing fucking that comes to mind. Yeah, I was going to say Letter County. Everything making everything like more straightforward and making it more popular and changing the the pervasive view and like that has to be great like in well, some you ways few, you got a few different archetypes right like uh you got trailer park boys which not everybody may know is actually canadian but holy shit fudge she's I fucking canadian eh 
Um, and, and obviously, but he's like a Ricky, Julian, Bobby, or a or a Leahy, or even a Randy. You know, that show's not emblematic of all Canadians, but it is supposedly, and I say supposedly because I am very clearly a West Canada and Central Canada person. I'll explain that in a minute. But this this shows like uh, I believe it's Manitoba or Newfoundland. I'm probably gonna get gutted online for not knowing where exactly it's from. <laughs> Cancelled. Probably, probably Manitoba. Uh, and in your Canadian uh, citizenship. Ah, uh, fuck off, bud. <laughs> <laughs> um, but like, my, I'm, like, okay, let me explain it. Central Canada is like Midwest, right? You got Alberta, you got Saskatchewan, you got Manitoba, and it's flat as fuck, and there's a lot of Native people there, and it's pretty... Uh, it depends where you are and who you are and who you're with. Uh western canada like bc is all like completely unceded territory they didn't actually take it um it still belongs to native people but the canadian government's just like no this is ours now i made this and it's oh, it's a big deal and that's where like wetsuit and shit's happening um then you got ontario over here which is where you have um letter kenny right if yeah. you uh, know anything about Letterkenny, that's like East Ontario over there in the cornfields and shit. Right and along then, the edge um, of Quebec, yeah. Yeah, and then the rest you know, of Canada is going to hate me for these explanations. But you got <laughs> French Canada, which is like Quebec. You got East Canada, which is like Newfoundland, Labrador, PEI, everything kind of on the... Honestly, Newfies need more fucking love. They do. They do. They do. Newfies are fucking tight. I'm not even going to like do them a disservice of ripping off their accent. But if you haven't heard a Newfoundland accent, go look it up on YouTube because it is the most unique one you're going to hear in North America. I fucking, fucking promise you. delightful. It is delightful. <laughs> mm -hmm. And then you got cold. Everything north is just cold. And that's, that's Canada. <laughs> it's just cold. God. Like depictions of rednecks in media, various things. Like you've got, you've got all these awesome depictions of media. Meanwhile, for me, it's fucking Duck Dynasty, or some no. fishing show, or like the the dudes who hunt alligators. Which legit, it was actually kind of cool to see hunting alligators be a thing that was you know depicted in media because that shit's hard. Let me just say, as someone who does it every now and then, depending on if my family needs extra hands, that shit's hard. <laughs> My fucking dad was addicted to that fucking show, Moonshiners. Oh god. Yeah, and it's like it's like, it's like redneck exploitation. Like they pick people who are walking stereotypes. stereotypes of the culture, and or they're not emblematic of the broad spectrum of what it is to be a Cajun or a redneck or coon ass or anything else. Like it's fucking weird. <laughs> but it sells. It does. It sells. Of course, it does. Like right. if you exploit, if you exploit and it, you know it escalate and exaggerate something into a big ass caricature, everybody loves to see that shit. Well, it <laughs> wouldn't be a podcast episode if we didn't hint at the horrible facets of capitalism. <laughs> <laughs> That's like part of our checklist. We always, yeah. <laughs> we always get around to that. Yeah. Did you say capitalism sucks. Oh well, mention it on the outro. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking man. Like, uh, it, having positive representation is nice, especially as somebody who's like mixed native, um, and like doesn't necessarily see a lot of that out there. It's pretty, pretty fucking tight, you know? Um, and yeah, it's, it's, it's done a little bit to make people who are in the rural areas maybe not feel like we have to hide our accents, but Jesus Christ, I still fucking do. Let me tell you what. Yeah. So that's something. <laughs> That's, 20 more years of the shit for it to become completely normalized and yeah. damn see that's something i i can't really relate to like in terms of like hiding an accent i guess maybe because it doesn't have that like uh like a, an accent from a big city doesn't have the same stigma as no. it does well, from like a small town from accent philadelphia <laughs> i guess like yeah <laughs> it happens <laughs> yeah <laughs> fuck around and find out now <laughs> home of I our lord and savior gritty uh, let me let me move you into a fucking figurehead of, for all Philadelphians and tell you fucking thank you. <laughs> fucking thank you. The nation, the world is grateful to you and to Gritty. Mm -hmm. Hail St. Gritty. Hail Gritty. Cheers to that. Honestly, I really, 
I feel like Philly has put so much energy into Gritty. I really feel like he might be like a protective, you know, entity around well, the city. Any, any, mascot, yeah. any mascot or or figurehead or concept or character that gets the amount of attention and fixation and obsession and love or desperately absolute hate right. is going to potentially spin up into an egregore. That's the basic co- abstract concept of what an egregore is. So oh like Gritty, God. when he first emerged and was presented to the public of Philadelphia, was looked at with such distaste. disdain and <laughs> yeah. confusion. Hatred, we all said, what the fuck is that? that and, and, and then, in true Philadelphia fashion, you decided to take that, that weird-ass fucking thing and make it y'alls, which is amazing, and thank you. <laughs> what it was, <laughs> I, I, can, I can distinctly remember, because I remember we saw it, and we were all like, oh my god, that thing is hideous. And then, <laughs> and then people were like, oh god, it's hideous. And we were like, how dare you talk about him like that? Yeah, exactly. And then, <laughs> and, and of course, the folks that the folks that came up with the marketing for Gritty, they knew exactly what to do. They yep. had him start shit talking every other mascot on Twitter, yep. which was hysterical. Yep. Holy shit! Gritty was a uh, marketing genius. Let's just He's uh... Gritty though, literally. <laughs> yes. Like, if you're gonna spin up an aggregar, and this is this is something that that ties back to DKMU, um, and Hexorius is something I wanted to talk about. Hexorius is one of the most recently developed one of the there are many but one of the most recently developed egregores you know of course we call them god forms um mm-hmm. that dkmu has produced as a community and it's kind of a testament to how carefully and thoroughly our community and really the cast community in general but dkmu has kind of taken that tech and and made it into a, a they've made it into a monster in a lot of ways it, it it shows how far we've come as a group because hexoria spun up incredibly fast yeah it was something that that just reared its fucking head one day and like i i remember some of the early efforts to create egregores pre dkmu and it took work to do it and they didn't have at least most of them didn't have the kind of coherence and sudden stability that the ones that we produce latter day are like um it has become a sure. fucking science and and in dkmu you see like the gamification of the creation of egregore mm-hmm. and it's it's a great piece of tech because like and this ties back to parapsychology so let's go way the fuck back into the 70s all right you've got a group of canadian parapsychologists who are trying to produce what they call an artificial poltergeist it's called the filth okay. experiment you probably heard about this from horror movies if you've heard about it at all, because there were a bunch of people who took that idea and then made, you know, horror movies about it, which they're scary, but they're not accurate. So they decided they were going to try to cultivate an artificial poltergeist in a lab, in a parapsychology setting, okay? And, and, and honestly, this is what actually helped me grok how to make a servitor in the first place, because I've tried to use the traditional methods and it didn't seem to work. And for these parapsychologists, they initially tried to do it by focusing and, you know, working out the backstory of this person, you know, the life history of this person, how they died, what they thought, what they liked to eat, what their favorite color was, and all this shit. And it wasn't working really well for them. And then eventually, they just started adopting the practice of throwing this artificial thing they were trying to spin up in Irish way. They sat around and told stories about fucking Philip. They got drunk and, and fondly remembered fucking Philip. And that's when they started to get results. Mm. And and that's that's kind of an indicator of how how uh, I guess an indicator of one good way to approach it because there's lots of ways to do this shit. This is just one of them. But whether or not they even realized it at the time, DKMU has kind of kind of carried that on in their own way. And so when you're working on spinning up servitors or not servitors, uh, egregores collectively, you start out with this very coherent set of attributions and correspondences and images and sensations and all this information and you work on that and then there there are folks who make it a game and they 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 realize it's a spiritual game in a way in a way they do know that what they're doing but they go full in they paradigm shift straight into being a zealot of that thing and Hmm. it's all about that thing and that concept all the time 24 7 balls out and that gives it so much more life and so much more 
to feed on and and understand and learn from and develop by and and it seems like that's that's become one of our one of our great pieces of tech one of them we have we have a lot of stuff that we've contributed over the years and we'll continue to mm-hmm. but like holy shit seeing the, the the results of all of that work over you know so much time in hexorius is fucking amazing yeah like, another one God that, to <laughs> with that is torch god um because i know people stand for torch god really hard yeah um, that's that standing is part of it too that's that balls out zealot shit they mm-hmm. go straight stand for torch god and also hail torch god so, <laughs> <laughs> oh man i'm one of those douchebags so yeah. And that, that's the thing that really kind of empowers them is like everybody who works with the egregores kind of like jives with their own ones and personally empowers it. Like anybody who knows me, the one that I put the most work into is Violet. That's like my mm-hmm. baby eyes. She's like fucking, I've put way too much work into her at this point. And I kind of had to like move on to other stuff because she's like a fucking whole complete concept and anything past that point would cause a uh, drift which is another thing we can talk about a little bit um yeah uh, which is essentially like when an egregore changes over time based off of differing input from differing people and drift can be like a serious fucking problem with an egregore it can and it's really it's kind of it's not really a scale because nothing is really truly a spectrum but two big problems and points and 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 hurdles that you have to get over when you're trying to produce an egregore are the concepts of coherence and drift. Coherence being like, so an egregore, for those who don't know, an egregore is a spiritual concept or entity that is fed into and sustained by multiple people, as opposed to a servitor, which is one person's effort. So an egregore is contributed to by every single person that knows about it and believes it and is putting work into it. And you could argue that people who have just heard the fucking name are also contributing to it. But everybody has their own inner vision and interpretation and understanding of that egregore. And coherence is the concept of each of those people having at least a somewhat congruent view of what this thing they're building is. So broad strokes, you know, this this entity's association is the color black. This is the 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 way that it appears. This is how it manifests itself. These are its symbols. These are the words. These are the things that it wants. These are the things that it doesn't want. These are the things it can teach. And you go into that with it, the, the the most important part about this is to give as many of those contributing magicians as coherent a concept as possible. Because then you have this concept that, because I mean, it's going to be like a telephone game on a spiritual level anyway, but if you can keep that message as concise and noise-free as possible going in, you end up with this very coherent concept. But then, say this group of five or 10 or 15 that are putting this egregore together decides, okay, it's solid enough, it's coherent enough, it's spun up enough, we can, we can hand it off to the rest of the community. Well, that's when drift becomes a problem. And drift is the, the, the notion of, so imagine the egregore as a, a coherent egregore, like a, a glass sphere, okay? And then you add more magicians to it who might not have all of the information. Say that you brought in, you know, 10 or 20 other people to work on this thing, but you didn't give them all of the information. Like some of, some of the source documents got lost or some shit. They have their own notion of what the thing they're dealing with is. And it doesn't have as much congruence with the original materials or the original magicians that built into it. And so, so it kind of are... starts to take a different shape. So you have that glass sphere of coherence, and then you start knocking chunks off of it and faceting it. And so there's going to be variations that happen. There's going to be, you know, drifting associations. Like, say someone... Say it's a skeleton. Say say this thing is a skeleton. The original group associates that skeleton with not death or evil or malevolence or anything like that, but like the underlying truth of your existence. Think like Memento Mori. Um, a reminder that one day you will die. Something like that. But you don't prime the magicians that you bring into this after that first wave with that shit. So they each have their own idea of what a skeleton represents, whether it's a you know spooky Halloween skeleton cardboard that <laughs> they put on their door every year, or 
it's a scary thing or you know they think about like dead people they think about bones exposed and wounds they think about all these other things they have all these loaded associations that they then feed into that egregore and add noise to the original coherent concept so that egregore starts developing facets and sometimes those facets are fucking awesome you can't always predict what's going to happen when an egregore drifts sometimes they develop realizations and these this is the moment where a lot of egregores seem to develop their own consciousness and self-awareness and understanding and self-preservation um sometimes the i mean you add new information and new energy into what they are sometimes weird things spin out of that and often they're they're awesome but sometimes they're not so you suddenly have an egregore that was serving its purpose performing its function and then it begins to act out or it begins to enact its purpose in ways that you didn't intend it to and it becomes more abstract and it <clears throat> becomes less vivid to everyone including the people who originally created it that's huh. what drift is and if you if you let that happen over time say you know 10 years later you've got hundreds of new magicians who are passing the concept of this egregore by word of mouth back and forth well, there's going to be different variations in that that continue to change that egregore over time. And that egregore is sustained by them and it's, it's fed by them and it's informed of how it should manifest hmm. and how it should think and react and go about its work. If by then it even continues to perform at the original function by which, for which it was created. So that's drift. And drift can be fucking amazing. But drift also needs to be taken into account when you're building these things in the first place. Right. So right. like when, when you build an egregore, it's not going to remain that way forever, especially if you release it to public, if you make it open source, essentially. Yeah, I think exactly. a really good example of this is Yahweh. Like, what were you saying Yahweh was? A Canaanite thunder god that became a war god that became, like, the Christian god? Yeah, like, um, like just broad spectrum. If you look back at at the deities and gods that are currently in popular worship across the board they all had their origin somewhere right? right what christians and catholics think of as god what uh folks in the various sects of islam look at as allah uh, all of these things i mean among among jewish folks there are variations as well and you if you apply that theory of coherence versus drift and abstraction to these broader concepts like imagine what the god of the old testament was like or the god of the you know the god of the early torah was like mm. or earlier law was like and what those came from in the beginning and how broad belief and widespread changes radical shifts to dogma have in turn impacted the egregores that they were that were being sustained by those prior belief systems huh. so, it's actually kind of an interesting thing i'm just thinking about right now like so take the christian god right so let's just let's just say that all gods are legitimate and they are real and they exist right so we'll just say that and i mean is a god an egregore i suppose an egr a god's there, a really there's egregore, is that yeah I yeah had... like the best the best sort of categorization that can be come up with at least in 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 one broad area of magic that being chaos magic and not all of us agree on this not even most of us but you've got a progression so you start off with a thought form which you know it's just like a fairly coherent eddy in in that spiritual space whether you call it the astral or the ether mm -hmm. or fucking whatever okay it's just a little moment of of coherence it's it's like it's like birds in flight mm. and it's just a few birds at first and they kind of move and shift in sort of a sort of an order and then you add more magicians to it and it becomes a larger flock and they shift and they dance and they move in in cogent ways but are each their own entity and all these things it, it, it all creates this broad image in the sky and and that egregore eventually grows and grows and grows until it becomes something like a god form and there's a lot of conjecture across the board, not just in the chaos community, but everywhere else that, that discusses theory. 
about at what point an egregore becomes a god form or if there is even really a difference. Like in my own observations, and I am not an authority on this at all, no, nobody can say they are, an egregore becomes a god form when it not only has its own self-awareness, its own thoughts and feelings and personality, its own agenda, its own confidence in itself to the point that even if everyone died that believed in it or knew its name, it could still continue to exist in some weird way by virtue of its own belief in itself. <clears throat> right. And so what you're saying so is like, like, so the energy that people put into a God form, right? So the energy that, that they're putting into it influences the God form, hence mm -hmm. the drift, right? Yeah. So yeah, yeah. this actually kind of makes me think of the shift in modern day Christianity. You know, like how a lot of it is seems is like this like radicalized oh, yeah. kind of thing. So if you like take where, where bad... Jesus has gone from, a, uh, gone from a a protector of the poor and a a yeah. warrior against capitalism into a prosperity theology, fuck the poor, let's hunt the homeless for sport. Yes, yes. Like Why, I don't, I don't, lied, I don't... Motherfucker. yeah, yeah. Like I mean, I'm not. This isn't for like the OG good Christians. Like you know who you no, are. No, of course you know. not. Y'all are, are out there, and I hope y'all are the majority. Right. And <laughs> but I guess it's it's like a tweet I saw once, you know, when someone says they're Christian, you know, are you like Republican Jesus or classic Jesus? You know, like which, you know, which flavor are you? And um no, I'm really kind of curious. So if if we took this theory of the Christian God and we had all these, you know, this sort of rise in these radical groups and they're praying to this entity, this God, um that would then cause that god to drift i suppose and maybe that's why i don't know maybe things go the way they go and i don't know i always just like because i always think about with christianity is like you know people say well if your god is loving and your god is this and that you know then why does your god let bad things happen you know why does you know stuff like that so i don't know yeah I mean, that's kind of an interesting idea to think about though i mean and as an ex-catholic yeah. I just want to say Yahweh is a prick, but I also <laughs> think um, in original Hebrew, wasn't it Yahweh Vauhe? Like, I, it's not supposed to actually be said Yahweh, and that's another thing I wanted to touch on, is that people mispronouncing a name almost spools up a different side to that egregore and makes it a mask of it, itself or like a, a different being altogether, right? Mm -hmm. Like if you were to look at like Yalde Vawe, like the original Jewish god, it doesn't seem to have the same level of like spite and selfishness and like demiurgeness that uh what we what we think of now as the Christian God would, you know? Mm -hmm. And I think that's kind of an interesting thing to note that, like, the perversion or mispronunciation or even appropriation of a name by people who it doesn't belong to can really make an entity take on a whole new shape or a whole new life, you know? They can. <laughs> I mean, and it sounds like we're talking about cut and dry concepts, but there's a lot of ways to view this um, in the psych model especially if you're going coming from a Jungian psych model, um, gods represent archetypes. And archetypes are sort of like concepts that are hard-coded into humans across the board, even among cultures that are not in contact at all. There are going to be broad archetypes. And certain gods, certain egregores and entities and heroic figures and mythological figures, and even down to shit we see in media every day tie into those archetypes. And so you think of think of an archetype like a big nebula, like think space, like big ass nebula. And you've got various cultural heroes and, and gods and spirits and god forms and all these things that represent that same archetype that are like stars within that nebula. They're all part of that same strange field, but they each have kind of coalesced in their own way. So like facets on a gem or stars in a nebula, they all are kind of tied back to the same concept. And some of them are stranger and more drifty away from that archetype than others. I mean, and if you go by that theory, it could be said that at some point when that, when that facet, that star becomes its own thing and becomes so adrift away from the origin archetype, it becomes a nebula of its own. You know, it, it's just, it's, it's a metaphor. It's a, it's a weird ass metaphor and we don't know yeah. for sure. It's just observations, but this is just observation by one magician, that being me. So like, yeah. it could 
fucking anything. You know? Oh, like, yeah. One way to look. And that that's why I love having these kinds of conversations because, you know, you can have three different theories and it, it doesn't matter who's right or wrong because you don't know. You know what I yeah, mean? Yeah, magic is fucking subjective as hell. Like, yeah, shit. and that's just, that's what I, that's really, that's the whole point of the podcast. <laughs> it's to oh, have yeah. the... <laughs> we have hit the theme. <laughs> right. Queer magic. Fuck yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Real queers doing real magical shit. <laughs> and honestly, like, I, we talk a lot about theory, but you don't have to know dick about theory to do magic. In the same way that you don't that know true. how to, you don't, you don't have to know how to build a fucking car to learn how to drive one. Correct. Okay? Mm -hmm. you, you don't know, how, you don't have to know anything about engines. You don't have to know anything about fucking inertia. You don't have to know the composition of rubber that makes up a tire to drive a car and it's the same thing with fucking magic okay it's exactly. just some folks like to geek the fuck out about cars and some ooh, people don't ooh, ooh, and 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 knowing how a car is put together doesn't mean you're good at driving it yes there you go <laughs> maybe you never learned to drive in your fucking life but you still love cars right so you also are armchair magician <laughs> <laughs> you know and of course and i we shit about armchair magicians but you know, sometimes some great fucking theories come out of those folks. It's just, you know, it would be nice to see them be the ones to actually do the like, experimentation on those Yeah, things, like, as get, well your, as get your hands theory, a little but, dirty. Come on now. Yeah. See, that, that's part one of the things I like about DKMU. Like, when you first joined DKMU, we call you an oyster. And oysters have to do oyster work. And oyster work is tagging Ellis and doing a bunch of other shit. So, like, go out there and get your hands dirty. Go out there and deface some public property. You know? <laughs> and if you get out there and be, oyster, be a, what sorry, was that? No, no. If you manage to be oyster well enough, you might just be a new fag one day. Yeah. And then if you exist for a while, a long while, you become an old fag. Yeah, and somewhere <laughs> and then, in between there, you, there's mid fags. Yeah, mid fags are a thing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Man. Yeah. yeah, old fag is like I think it's like seven plus years you got to to be to be an old fag at this point. Oh God, does that mean I'm a double old fag? Am I a double <laughs> crawly? Really? You I'm a double are... crawly now. I'm a big bad black blood <laughs> double crawly. Fuck yeah! You're in uh founder territory for how long you've been a part of the group? Because like you were there at the inception of like the LS when Argel was doing it on occult forums and shit. So like. You were watching it when it was going down, so I mean, yeah, there ain't many God. other people who've been around fucking longer. And this is how my fucking attitude has changed. Like when the Ellis was first developed, like I was, I was watching and kind of following along and working with it a little bit and talking a bit about it. And then when Ellis manifested, which was what, like a year or two later, I, I don't know, maybe less than that. Like that shit grew teeth and legs real fast. So. <laughs> Like when when Ellis became a concept within D, within DKMU, which wasn't DKMU at the time at all, it was the Modern Underground. I was one of the ones who was like, "Y'all, this is becoming super dogmatic, and you need to be careful with it." I was one of the fucking naysayers. I was one of the people who was like, "Y'all, you need to remember this is tech. This is just tech. This is not a god. This is an egregore. It is a piece of tech." Right. It is a piece of tech that grew a personality and a manifestation and all these things. And I was very much against the notion of treating this piece of this, this developed piece of tech that although was incredibly useful and fucking groundbreaking and amazing. And now it's massively pervasive and popular. You're seeing on fucking t-shirts and shit. Oh my but like, God. I was one of the ones who was like, please don't worship this thing and become as dogmatic as every other tradition. Please don't do it. Like, mm -hmm. so I was real hesitant to work with Ellis for a long time, a long time. <laughs> but like, yeah, I remember being real, real butt mad about, about how I observed Ellis to be taken. And I, I wasn't really giving my fellow marauders the benefit of the doubt like I should have, because everything was fine. Everything is fine. Hell, Ellis is massively useful. I mean, Ellis, you know, is is developed far past, I think, what anybody, including Argel, ever expected. So, it also has been a fucking messy ride getting there, though. Yes, yes, it has. Lessons have been learned. <laughs> Holy shit! Yep. 
I will say, um, I always, I always feel, especially now, even, even more so, I always feel that, um, DKMU and Witches Betwixt were kind of meant to collide at some point because one of the first recording sessions that I got together with, with Scott in one of the first episodes, we were talking off camera because I, what I was saying is, is I want to create a place where you know people that practice witchcraft can go and get information for free you know what i mean not just like and not just pirating people's books for free not that kind of shit just real information from their peers that it's just available and and then i i was like i want to create like a magical internet or something like that i said something like that and he said well there's actually this group out there that kind of did that with the, the tagging of a linking sigil yep. and i was like he's like i can't remember the name you know it was like one of those kind of moments he's like i can't remember the name but i did hear about it and it's called the linking sigil and that's what they do and i was like oh that's really cool and we kind of like tabled it you know and we just started recording and then sophia was like hey you do magic and shit and i was like yeah i do magic and shit you do magic and shit and you're like yeah dkmu and shit and ellis and linking sigils and i was like hey hold up <laughs> This you looks know, like a pattern. <laughs> yeah. My God, synchronicity! It's actually like fucking infamous for this. Like you talk about it and you see the sigil, and then it comes knocking and it grabs you by the ass and it pulls you in so hard. Like mm -hmm. people literally show up at our server being like, "Okay, what?" And we're we'll like, "What?" <laughs> 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 fucking know what <laughs> what do you people oh, want those, those people are fun i feel bad oh, for them no. though I, like i feel bad but i'm also like hey welcome you're finally here not yeah. to make another matrix reference which i do in almost every fucking episode <laughs> i'm so sorry but you're i'm not good. sorry you guys are literally the ones like in the, you remember the beginning of the movie where the, the text on his screen wake up neo like that's you guys you know like <laughs> like this the, the shit rabbit. that you do <laughs> yeah follow the white that's, rabbit <laughs> that's kind of pervasive across the entire current it's just it, it's something that kind of happens like i stumbled into the z cluster in much the same way um mm -hmm. and i'm sure that this is also the kind of shit that goes on in, in cmg and any of the other you know, uh, large bodies of chaos magicians, and arguably CMG is is potentially larger than DKMU is at this point. But like, it it fucking happens. This is how people get dragged into the current. This is this is how it works. Like, you you get these weird ass hints. Like, I, I've got a funny story for y'all. <laughs> I was talking to my wife about this. So, I live in a little subdivision on it, kind of embedded on the north side of town where I. Am. We've got a gas station up the street, Seven Eleven. Well, I wear on my left hand and on my ring finger a really large silver ring with Chaos Star on it, mm. okay? And it's really the only outward sign of being a part of that current that I wear. I, I do wear a lot of occulty witchy shit because, you know, I'm, I'm that 80s goth kid. I'm, I'm basically one of the goth kids from fucking South Park. Hell yeah. If, but, if Butters eventually became one of them because, uh, yeah. Yeah. So, <laughs> <laughs> That's the only outward sign I wear. And I've been going to this gas station for months now. And there's this kid they hired back in, like, October. And he saw the ring. And he's like, hey, what's that? And I close <laughs> up and I notice that he's wearing a little pentagram. And I'm like, oh! Aww. Totally can't. Little baby. And then I'm like, oh, fuck. What do I do? Oh. um, Well, it's 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 an eight-pointed star. It's a, it's a chaos sphere. Oh. Well, what's that? And then I'm like, sorry, I gotta go. Because <laughs> I'm like, oh god, I don't want to do it. I don't want to do it. So then I come <laughs> back a few months later. And he's like, hey, um, how you doing? And he's trying to have this awkward conversation with me through the hanging glass plastic, you know, that you know, the yeah. perfect hell world is introduced to every gas station. Yeah, through a mask, so you uh, <laughs> double can't hear what anyone's saying, you know. <laughs> exactly. And I don't remember what he asked or what I said, but, like, after what I walked away going, oh god. Did I, did I give him information? Did I give him a hint that's going to lead him in the wrong way? And this has gone on for months now. And so last night, I walked in. And this is this is me with 30 hours of uptime. I had not slept. Ugh. I was fucking dumb. But I just I was like, oh my god, I need an energy drink, and I want a honey bun. So I went into this, <laughs> I went into this fucking 7-Eleven on a whim. And the kid's there. 
and I'm just kind of in my haze. Okay. You know, that 30 hours away haze. Uh And I'm paying for my shit. And he says something. And I'm not really paying all that much attention, but something in my head goes, wait, what the fuck did I just hear? And I, I, gl- I look up at him, and he looks so anxious, y'all. He's just like, oh my god, what the fuck? And I'm like, well, sorry, what was that? He said, I, I, I said, and he leans close, and he says, I said, death to the image? Like he's uh, saying a fucking code word at a club he shouldn't be at, y'all. Oh, wow. And I'm like, no, that. And I had to sit there and go, I was sitting there going, did, did he just fucking say that? Oh my God. <laughs> and then I'm like, yeah, hail the new flesh, man. And he just looks like, he looks like I have told him, <laughs> like, it looks like I've said, yep, you're one of the cool kids now, bud. You're one of the cool kids now. And he is so excited. You rocked his world oh in that moment. <laughs> And he's and, and he's like he's standing there like awkward like and I'm sitting here going am I supposed to fucking say some shit right now like am I supposed to give some weird ass like red pill blue pill monologue what the fuck am I supposed to do now and, and <laughs> I finally go with what's your handle and he goes my handle you mean like my magical name and I'm like no no on the Discord and he's and the look on his face y'all he's just like <gasps> in his the, head, Discord? He's like, There's the Discord Discord. <laughs> Like yeah yeah go to the site on Discord link. So I'm waiting for I'm waiting for my adorable little baby witch to show up. Like I'm waiting. <laughs> oh man, this is this is shit that happens. Like every few years, this kind of shit will happen. Like if I'm in a large enough city, and it's weird how people who are part of the current, whether they're marauders or or not, tend to run into each other outside of the realm of probability. Like mm-hmm. uh, in 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 the town where I'm at, I was getting my car fixed. And, and it's it's a good shop. Like I'm getting my car fixed. I'm super pissed off. I'm mad because like this is you know three thousand dollars worth of repairs I'm Oof. about to pay for. Not and just I'm maintenance on, shit. I'm working on chucking up my wallet, and the guy reaches for my card, and on his forearm there's this big, well tattooed chaos star. Ooh. And I'm like, and immediately the old fag in me is like, hey bud, yeah. You know? <laughs> or like and this this happened a little bit a little bit ago too like i'm at some random shop like it's fast food place i want to say the guy leaning in to to hand me my receipt is wearing a chaos star around his neck there are not that many of us that i should be running into these people that often mm-hmm. but when you're part of the current it fucking happens sometimes I see them too all the fucking time and the problem is I don't outwardly flag that I'm a part of the current like I don't have a chaos sphere I don't uh I haven't flesh crafted a linking sigil all my tattoos are like animals um I mean I have the infinity sign slash Métis symbol on me that's like a widely applicable symbol but it's it's interesting too because um I live in Toronto in like fucking close to downtown area I'm not gonna say where of course um but I should you not less than it's like two half blocks, which equates to a block away from mm-hmm. my house. There is a sticker on a bicycle stand that says, hello, my name is one five six. Oh, and my I God. saw that and I was like, uh, <laughs> excuse me? my neck fucking craned and I took five steps back and I took a photo of it and I put it up on the Facebook and the discord. I'm like, yo, who did this? And somebody put that sticker up and was tagging for Domus, not even fucking being on the Facebook group or in the Discord and like, I'm I'm out there finding their work and like, the odds of that in a city, the size of Toronto, I have to tell you, is just mm. bonkers. And it's, it's, it's all about the odds. Like, I tell this story about coming, coming across marauders and other members of the current, but what I'm not saying is that even before COVID, me leaving my house more than two or three times a week was an oddity so the odds of finding these people is very rare but it's happened in new orleans it's happened in san antonio it's happened in corpus christi it's happened in austin it's happened in denver it's happened in colorado springs hell it fucking happened in yellowstone like you end up running into them the current drags us together sometimes and it's kind of weird that way but it's it's also fascinating and kind of delightful it's kind of like the secret not so secret club because once you're in it you realize how many people are actually even aware of it by proxy like like the group three teeth and they're out there touring with tool and stuff and you can go and talk to the guy after show and be like death to the image you'd be like hail the new flesh man what's up and he'll like know what the fuck is up 
because they had the linking sigil on like their second album and they have a song called insubstantia that literally talks about like our what alice rose wrote with that and like we get referenced by these groups and it's like really fucking interesting like i have a friend who isn't even doesn't even like know that i'm in this group and has new flesh tattooed on their chest and i just <laughs> saw that and i just died and i messaged them on instagram i'm like nice new flesh flesh y'all ever uh death to the image <laughs> <laughs> honestly it's, it's kind of a testament to the to the the, the the thickness of our memes at this point like yeah it's a fucking thing man but and um, people who don't even know it are, are saying it and using it right and it's 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 an interest, it's interesting that it's such a polarizing force because even in the chaos magic community, it's a polarizing force. Like a lot of my friends that were part of the Z cluster once they found out that I was a part of DKMU, they're like, "Oh my god, you're part of the fucking problem." And uh -huh. There's a lot of vi there's a lot of vitriol, especially from like the the archetypical old fags, the real old fags of I never the chaos magic, that. right? Not just like not just like a sporty somethings, but like the older folks are like what the fuck are y'all doing because they've kind of forgotten the point or they've lost track of the point or they've become so static in their own beliefs and their own paradigm and their own view of the current that they don't have room for for anyone else that comes in afterward and they've forgotten that they too back in the day that you know back in the z cluster topi you know church of the sub genius height of discordia days were the new fags then like and, and this goes back to the conversation we had before where every prior generation bitches about the newer one that goes back to fucking socrates mm -hmm. <laughs> fucking i i can't remember how long ago was it like what was what was it that he said i can't i can't it was no it wasn't socrates or aristotle and it was it was third or fourth century bc but it was something like the youth today are indignant don't read uh or don't listen to their elders and spend too much time reading or something like that yeah, it was something like that. But like it, that's that's been the case. The people, older generations, you know, of of living people, older generations within interest groups and focus groups, whether they're religious or not, it could be about model fucking trains, are always going to bitch about the younger people coming in, no matter what. It's just I, kind of a thing that happens. It's a thing humans do. It's part of our condition. Yeah, like I fully accept my biases. You know, like I fully accept them. But I, I can only hope, and I, and I don't think so, because it's just not in my personality, but I don't think I'm going to be one of them old, like, when I'm old, you know, 50s, 60s, 70s, like, I don't think I'm going to be one of them old people that are, like, I don't know, stuck. See, that's the messed up part about this, because a lot of those folks who are stuck right now probably said the same shit that you're saying right now. I would, yeah, and oh, I don't know. That's I the just, scary I, part of it, like, I hope it doesn't happen. Become, we could become boomers in our old age, except it'll, I, it'll be another word. Like, we could all oof. potentially be that person. We just have to fight really hard to both not do that and also yeah. not be, hello, hello kids, you know? I just make sure I still do drugs as I get older. <laughs> <laughs> I don't stop doing mushrooms. No, I'm serious, though. Like, that's a big part about um, what changes it is suddenly... We're, when we're young very often people have like this real wild psychonaut aspect of like i want to explore my mind plumb the depths of reality and sometimes it just takes one bad salvia trip to scare somebody off of magic fucking forever although realistically speaking salvia is less likely to do that it's just an overwhelming experience if you want to have something that's really going to tunnel you into what fish called the schizo narrative before um acid will really do that to you mm. so, Honestly, will mushrooms, and so just be is, careful if this is this is something that that's been a topic of hot discussion a heated heated fucking debate and it's something that Ami or sorry sophia and i were both talking about today literally today um there's a problem in modern occult movements that i don't feel like people are talking about that they need to be fucking talking about mm -hmm. and that problem is that Folks out, folks out there have mental health problems. They have mental health illness. They have mental illnesses and they have issues that they are fighting with every day. And not just because of COVID, you know, everybody's fucking depressed because of COVID and deficient on vitamin D and all the other fucking things. But what we are learning is that mental illness is not as rare as it was once believed to be. And everybody's fighting with something. And mm -hmm. 
sometimes those things that they're fighting with and the symptoms they're experiencing get tied in with their magic. Mm-hmm. And they probably, especially in the United States, because of how bad our mental health system is and our mm. behavioral health is and yeah. how, how strongly we stigmatize shit, they are resistant to taking a mundane approach to trying to treat those things because you know they they got prescribed prozac one time and it didn't work well you know prozac's great for a lot of folks but for some folks it just doesn't fucking work for me it didn't and and so they're hesitant to go to a psychologist or psychiatrist or if you're american there's a good chance you can't fucking afford to so or you'll be stigmatized yeah and you fall into this area this gray area where your symptoms are something you need to cope with and one of the coping mechanisms if you're a magician, is to handle them via magic, which is absolutely valid. Mm-hmm. The problem is that you're going to have people who don't know the harm that they could fucking do by giving the advice of, oh, you're seeing you're seeing and hearing voices? You should do some DMT about it. Uh, okay, yeah. for someone, yeah. and yeah. This, is, this, is, this is fucking science, this is not me just being anti-drug because I'm not, but it's as someone... Thing who is legitimately schizophrenic, let me just say to anybody who is experiencing psychosis, if you have the genetic predisposition for bipolar disorder or schizophrenia specifically, you need to be very careful about acid and DMT. If you're going to do it, take tiny, tiny doses. Because that shit, that that can accelerate and set fire to the brain of someone who is not actively showing symptoms or hasn't even had you know those genes begin to activate and the changes in their brain to begin happening that can cause that shit to happen and for folks that have found a coping mechanism outside of psychiatry like they they do hear things they do see things they smell and experience things that they've got their shit at least together enough that they can manage day to day if someone like that takes a big ass dose of dmt they might never be the same again. And that's mm-hmm. not always, or even most of the time, a good thing. This is the kind of shit that makes people lose their jobs and spend the rest of their lives living under bridges. And 35% of the homeless population in the United States is schizophrenic. Don't be the fucking asshole that does that to someone you don't know just because you want to plug DMT for some reason. Don't be yeah, that guy. Definitely. That guy's a cunt. Don't be that guy. Mm-hmm. Like You and have like- to be fucking careful. And, like, I don't have a family history of it, but it's true. Like, I've, I've seen people who I, I know who've, like, lost themselves on that shit. And as much as it does work for me, not everything works for everybody. And if you do have a family history, you need to be aware of it, right? Um, you do. You really do. It's, like, and it's, just, it's a risk that you need to be aware of going into it, whether or not you decide. I'm not going to tell somebody not to do it, but I yeah. want them to be in what could potentially happen. Like, And there's a reason that DMT... In, in traditional indigenous practices is treated with a degree of reverence and it's mm-hmm. it's a sacrament that is kept within ritual boundaries and the people so, who undergo that sacrament are kept within this very strong framework to keep them stable and they have people around them to help them mm-hmm. if you're that's just deriving key in your fucking kitchen and doing it because you know you 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 hear a voice in your head that that has none of that protective trapping it has none of that framework to support you so um, it's it's fucked up what people do to themselves sometimes yeah. and, and they're trying to self treat and, and that's the shame of it like they they're trying to do something that they believe will help them and misguided people who don't know the harm they do are, are believe a lot of them do but I, I doubt many people do this because they're malicious they just do it because they're ignorant well you what know. it usually comes down to is a person gets results from something and they're very often happy to think that that's going to be something that can help other people and sometimes it really can so yeah. often they're quick to prescribe their own cure for other people who it may not be applicable for right exactly. and, and like, it, it is always yeah. something to be aware of um Sorry, what were you gonna say? Oh, it's just, it's 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 it goes back to that subjective experience, that qualia. Like for me, my drug of choice is salvia, and I don't have any of the bad shit that happens when mm-hmm. I've taken it in the past. But for me to irresponsibly say this is the way, 
when, you know, for me, it's a profound experience, but for somebody else, they start screaming incoherently and throw themselves out of a three-story fucking window. What did I just do? Yeah. No, I get you. And if I came across <laughs> like that, like, I'm sorry for sure. No, like, no, no, no. That was clarification for anybody listening. Yeah. It might not, have, might not have caught that. Yeah. And and another thing I was going to say, too, is often a, lot, a big problem with a lot of these substances is they're divorced, divorced from their cultural identity. Like, psilocybin mushrooms were sacred to the indigenous people everywhere that they grew and they're from all over the fucking planet pretty much you can find psilocybin mushrooms pretty much wherever you can find people um it, not to mention specific things like ayahuasca and how that's very sacred to the people in the area where that comes from you know or peyote to the people in the regions where that grows so like all of these groups have their own individual medicines and very often they're taken uh, in modern times, just completely out of context, completely without sem- ceremony, completely without respect to the spirit of the the plant, because regardless of whether or not you believe in spirit model, sometimes spirit model believes in you. You yeah, know what I mean? I mean? You're not an <laughs> island, and even even stripping away the the indigenous beliefs and dogmas attached to these substances like if you see that every time and and peyote is one that that uh, being from you know the, the the texas south texas area and having like big bend national park be like one of my favorite places and the surrounding area outside of the park being where i've you know found peyote in the past like if you are going to undergo one of these you know these these, these sort of chemonostic experiences and you see that other cultures that use these substances surround it in a specific type of ritual like a specific archetype of ritual there's no harm in sitting down and writing one out according to your own fucking paradigm and giving yourself that same support going in but like take that shit as a warning because these are these are cultures and paradigms and belief systems that have used the shit for generations they've mm-hmm. had time to figure out what works and what doesn't so like look at the theory behind what they're doing and the process that they're using and fucking emulate it within your own paradigm so that you can benefit from, you know, literally generations of fucking up and relearning and trial and error. Like, yeah. and, and this, this, this may be sort of the, the crust bag, old bag view, but like, there are times when you don't need to reinvent the wheel. Sometimes it's important to go with something brand spanking new, like bleach burn new, shiny, and, and try to figure it out from the ground up to see if there was something somebody missed or some artificial limitation that was placed on it yeah that's fucking important but when that could cause permanent physiological changes to your brain which that's what bipolar disorder and schizophrenia do schizophrenia Mm -hmm. in fact can be diagnosed by mri alone because of the structures that it changes in the brain if you are at the risk of doing irrevocable harm or radical change to yourself, like your brain that you can't fix. It, it's worth it to go into it with a little bit of fucking caution. Mm-hmm. You know, like at least at least know about arrowhead. Like I see kids these days jumping into shit without even knowing stuff. Like uh, I I've met a lot of people who've been like, oh yeah, you I, you want to do drugs? Let's do shrooms. And then they order them online. They they split the dose with me, and then they do it. And then, like, I'm referencing a specific event, obviously. And then <laughs> they'll have a bad trip because they took too much. And I asked them, like, how did you split them up? And they're like, well, I, I weighed them out. And it's like, uh, no. did you know that they're not potency-based by weight? They're potency-based on spore. And then the person goes, what? And you're like, yeah, so obviously yeah. crops are going to get you a lot higher than than stems are and if you have something that's more granular like the parts that have fallen apart they often have all of the sediment and the spores that have fallen off in the bags at the corners also that's why um people who are like frequent trippers often lick their bags to make sure they get all the spores off and the, the yeah. person's just like oh no and they had like a, a mini dark night of the soul as they had to like go through a whole bad trip that that lasted for like days on end and i gave them the advice to get out of it too because like i told them one 
start drinking a lot of water because how your body flushes mushrooms out is through your urine. Go pee as much as you can and drink vitamin C because it depl de uh, depletes that and restoring it helps you come back to sobriety a little quicker. That's at least what I was told. It's anecdot anecdotal evidence. Don't science quote me with that, but it, it seems to work and uh, they listened and uh, three days later, after it was complete, like I said, it would be out of their system, which I actually knew that from drug test uh, information I had read. Um, it was completely out of their system, and they weren't having any more panic attacks. And also telling them that helped them reassure uh, themselves that it would be completely gone in three days. Because, like, there is a little bit of a placebo effect to something that is, like, that mind-altering, you know? Mm -hmm. and, and if cool. someone were to tell you, oh, no, this can be a permanent change, they're going to fucking focus on that, right? But when they I told are, them, no, like, it's, it's going to be out of your body in three safe. days. Yeah, and when yeah. I say, no, it's out yeah. of your body in three days, you're going to be golden on Wednesday. They were fucking golden on Wednesday, right? And that's, an, that's another thing, is people go into this stuff alone, and they've never and they just jump at it and if you're somebody who does that and you really want to do it like props to you you mad bastard but a lot of people don't do drugs alone by the first time they do it with other people you who need, have done it you need a sitter who has done it before yeah <laughs> i mean an arrowhead is a is a massively yes. awesome resource like it really is and there there's a lot of things going into like psychonautics and 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 exploring chemonosis that that people need to think about that they generally don't like one of them is the fact that uh, a portion of America, or a portion, I say Americans, but a portion of, of people all over the world have methylation disorders and their genes determine how quickly they can metabolize any given substance. Like specifically what I'm thinking of are a couple of genetic errors that are referred to generally as CYP2 and CYP3. You'll see it listed as CYP asterisk 2 or CYP asterisk 3. These are genes that determine how well and how quickly you will metabolize any given drug that you consume, whether that is like warfarin in a clinical setting, or a fucking Prozac, or lithium, or THC, or DMT, or LSD, or anything else. And I didn't know anything about this shit up until I moved to Colorado, <laughs> because the weed I had smoked before I got here was like fucking hydrogram ditch weed. It was <laughs> not very potent. Meanwhile, here, you can buy things by percentage potency of THC, and that shit goes up to almost 40%, which, yeah. you know, here my wife is, with a perfectly functional methylation, you know, methylation cycle and the ability to metabolize all this shit, puffing on these cartridges of weaponized high-potency <laughs> THC, and she's just having a little giggle fit, y'all. I take a weak little hit off of that shit. And I'm asleep for 12 hours and miserable for another 24. Wow, turns it's out so funny. This whole time I've been hitting like, my pen. <laughs> yeah, it turns out that I have one of those variants, specifically CYP3, which basically, if you want to break it down, means that if I were to eat a 10, like a 10 milligram THC edible right now at 9 or 8.30, tomorrow at 8.30, I will still be high and I will be miserable. That also means that for a little over 90 days, if I were to go up and take a drug test, I would still show up as having THC in my system. And folks that have this shit going on frequently don't know it's a thing at all. They have no way of knowing. They, they, don't, they don't have a genetic test, which I got mine through 23andMe and Super Cheap. You can even get your raw genetic data and throw it somewhere else so that you can look at all the information. It's pretty rad. I kind of want to do that one. I did the Ancestry <laughs> one. That one sounds Honestly, cool, too. If if Ancestry gives you access to your raw genetic data, you can put it into a tool called Prometheus, and it will tell you all of your risk factors. Just keep in mind that when you read those risk factors, just because you have those genetics doesn't mean that those genes manifest at all. Yeah. So, yeah. Like, it might say, oh, you're going to die of cancer, but no. Yeah. It just means that you might be, like, one Predisposed. Or... Yeah, exactly. But, like, yeah, like, like, a lot of folks don't know that these things are... They don't. They don't know these are a thing at all. They just think, oh well, I smoked weed that you know that one time and I was fine and stuff. This will be okay. And there's also the tendency of people to be like, oh well, you know, I took something like like. There's a story by Henry Rollins, and I love Henry Rollins. I do. Where he, it's, I think he did it for a show called This Is Not Happening. It's a comedy show that uh, I think Ari Shapir hosted, and he's talking about 
doing LSD because one of his bandmates in Black Flag said, you're a real asshole. You should take some LSD. Oh, and I'm not going to no. tell the whole fucking story. I think it's called Punk Rock Hyenas. <clears throat> but the, the gist of it is that he did the thing that so many people fucking do, where he's with someone who provided him with acid. He took one blotter and it melted and they waited about half an hour. Nothing was happening. So they took another. Oh, and no. They waited another half hour and they took another. No. Until he had had, until he had, had four. <laughs> and honestly, like, this is the kind of thing that happens. It just happens. It happened to me. It happens to dozens of, or like, does I say dozens, hundreds of people, thousands of people that move into or go and, you know, take vacations into weed legal states in the U.S. To the point that it was legislated, at least in Colorado, that every single type of edible or candy containing THC has to be meted out in 10 milligram increments, and that's it. And that started with the tradition of the rookie cookie, because it used to be that you could just buy a big ass, big ass hash cookie or, you know, big ass, you know, THC laden cookie, right? you know, made with wheat butter or whatever, a brownie or something like that. And they would eat the whole fucking thing. And then they would just think they were dying. (laughs) (laughs) And so you'd have people going to the hospital like, oh my God, I'm dying. I ate a whole cookie. And people were like, you were only supposed to take a bite, you dumb fuck. So but even still, we, like, it's just weed. You're not going to die. <laughs> no, no, you might think you're dying, but you're not going to yeah. die. It's like, getting, it's like getting a bite from one of my tarantulas. Like, they fucking hurt. They might hurt for days, but it's not going to kill you. It's <laughs> going to hurt a lot. Um, but, yeah, eventually it became such a problem that, that it was ruled that, that any edible had to be just, just portioned out in 10 milligram increments so that people would not, you know, cram an entire fucking 100 milligram THC cookie in their face and end up in the ER. <laughs> so that's a thing but like if you if you if you act weirdly to drugs in the past like you know if you took something and it was really ultra strong or something you know be aware of that shit that you might have one of those genetic variations and dose accordingly i wish you uh i wish you were around for episode 45 which was we talked about drugs (laughs) actually we talked about like different substances and stuff like that but i would love to revisit that topic down the road that sounds like another you know really good topic to um, but like yeah, drugs and drugs and magic are always kind of tied in their own way. It's like <clears> we kind of weave in and out, you know. On the Venn diagram of people who use drugs, there's a big overlap between occultists and oh yeah, <laughs> and folks that partake in recreational substances. Oh yeah, them. definitely. Yeah, I mean, I think a I think a drugs part two episode is definitely in the future, especially with a uh, how passionate and how knowledgeable you seem to be about everything. I appreciate that. I I'm not an expert on any of it, but <laughs> if, if people can learn from the ways that I have fucked up over the years, then the, the experiences were not wasted. Right. It's like yeah. learn from my mistakes. Learn from them. <laughs> I'm telling God. you. <laughs> like this, like the other thing is like if you're driving through Mexico, don't eat food from an all subs in in the hot case because Oof. you will suffer. Oof. You can't imagine. <laughs> it's that kind of shit. Like, learn from my mistakes. Don't read I heard that story. Of these things. Oh, yeah, yeah. I, I, I didn't realize I told you that one. Oh, <laughs> you told me that one. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, it's okay. It's okay. But I'm sorry for you. No, no, that's fine. People forget pain over time. <laughs> Why else would we continue to have fucking kids if we didn't forget pain? People Why else would I continue pain? to eat dairy after I'm fucking lactose intolerant? God because fucking Because cheese is me. fucking delicious. Speaking as a yeah. fat person, cheese is <laughs> It's ice cream that gets me, if I'm being honest. Ice cream is great. Cream I can handle cheese. Great. Ice cream kills me. Honestly, yeah. ice cream or gelato. Oof. Oh, so good. Oof. Anyway, so yeah, like, magic is a wild topic. It's interesting how magic can branch off into so many different things like you could go into conversation about magical theory and end up talking about cryptids or like missing 411 like the, the weird sort of pseudo parapsychology that, that david politis does about national parks you could go into any one of any weird ass theories you know that might belong more on like coast to coast than than any occult forum but it's, it's amazing how some subjects just lend themselves to others yeah it, it really is remarkable and we we go on so many different tangents on this show um yeah, we did yeah. not keep to any fucking thing today no but the, you that's know what the I'm t- that's the whole point and i'm totally down with that um but we that's are good at two hours coming up on two hours i don't know how to Holy do math fuck. <laughs> it's a good episode it was a very good episode um but i do have to get to bed soon <laughs> 
So I have to well, get up at five. <laughs> thank you guys for having me. I, yeah, thank I, you for being here. Yeah, it was really cool to have you here. I like I, we'll probably just dial you up for any other fucking topic we want to talk about because you seem to be <laughs> very jazzed to discuss all things magical and queer, which is what we love to do here. <laughs> Well, if I if I don't know what the current topic is, I'll just fucking say I don't fucking know. Sorry, guys. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, thanks for having me. I really appreciate it, y'all. Yep. Yeah, it was a blast. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. So we're gonna sign off, um, and we will see you in the next one. Don't summon what you wouldn't need to fucking banish. Something along those lines. <laughs> Drink damn grape juice. Yeah. <laughs> Eat your fucking rock. a quick little test record just to get the audio uh quality going yeah yeah we're uh we're good okay so the idea i was kind of having for tonight fish is like bring in get you to chat with jay and like meet him and say hi and kind of get a feel for each other a little bit and then we're gonna kind of jump into the episode on a theme that we agree on um as a group we had a few ideas. Jay was actually just venting about frustrations in regard to the medical system. And I was like, you know, it really sounds like you've got the justification for a fucking curse on your hands, which I know is also like your hot button topic, right? So yeah, we, could, I don't know. we could we could talk tech about how how vexing, hexing, cursing and in general malefic work works if that's what you guys want to do. Absolutely. And we can I'm sorry, I'm trying to eat, like, dinner real quick. <laughs> I'm trying not to be rude. Um, but yeah, that sounds that sounds perfect. Then we can do that. Yeah. So I guess I'll start by chatting a little. Um, I met Jay through, like, a trans gaming, uh, I guess it was Clan on Destiny, and we just ended up talking magic for a while, and, uh, Turns out he knew some knew some shit, and we ended up like talking for a while. And he was like, "Oh wow, you actually know your shit too." So like, kind of here we are years later after it. And I I met Fish over on uh, my DKMU Discord server this uh, summer. She showed back up like she was an O O G member like mm. there from the fucking start of it. But then like was quiet and observed it for a lot of the time so like kind of came out and was really vocal lately and she's been a great friend since i've met her like very much like one of my favorite people on that server so oh my god you're <laughs> it's true you're wonderful <laughs> hang on let me hit the bong here yeah but yeah what do you what do you like to do for magic fish tell me about yourself God. <laughs> right now. I guess right now I'm just kind of doing more reading, like uh working on this 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 thing I'm writing is really requiring me to go back and read up on some of the deeper theories of things that I've been you know, <clears throat> some of the shit for a long time. These surface levels. Oh, you're cutting out again. <laughs> do you have audio? Oh, God damn it. I do. Ah. Mm. Let me turn it off. Yeah, I was like, I hope that's not me. <coughs> there, is this a little bit better? Sounds better, yep. Yeah, it sounds more clear. Okay, good. Oh, good. So, like, uh, I've been I've been operating with some of these basic theories for a long time, but I didn't really understand their origins or the deeper more abstract nuances of them so like sitting down and writing this um i'm having to go back and really make sure that i understand like for myself and for the writing whether or not i've i've been using some of these concepts correctly or if i'm quoting them correctly or if i'm missing nuances that would be otherwise really fucking useful to put in the book so that's the 101 book uh it's it's it, the 101 book is kind of turned into a 
101 magical theory as opposed to like just basic <laughs> basic tech like I do talk about basic tech in it but mm -hmm. it's more of like hey try this this is the concept on which this works so if the the we offered the offered practice that you've been given doesn't really vibe with you here's how to figure out a way to do it that does god that's so. such a fucking needed book i mean it's it's not technically a 101 but like like you were saying there's not really any like good introductionary books to to chaos magic that isn't just like fucking crap like lieber null or something you know like lieber null had a lot of really great shit in it it's just that peter carroll puts his own specific spin on it mm -hmm. that one like as a first exposure creates this kind of limited view of what chaos magic is and what it can be and and really kind of isolates us away from the whole postmodernist view of magic in general but like it also just sort of feeds into his own fucking hype it's mm -hmm. it's it's an intro to chaos magic but it's also like a recruiting tool for the iot so i don't, I don't know, know it's, it's like the when you write a thesis you have to lay out your bias your personal bias before you actually start it's part that of why true. introductions in academia exist. Mm -hmm. And I don't really feel like he was real clear about what his personal bias was when he wrote that book, which is, in essence, a magical thesis. Yeah. Hmm. Interesting. I don't know. No, that does make sense, because you do, you do have to... Because especially if you're, if you're trying to write, like, an objective piece, like, an, an objective informational piece, like, you have to kind of say, like, hey, well, hey, this is where I'm coming from. You know, it's still going to have your own kind of spin on it, no matter how objective you try and present the material. Exactly. Like, for this book, I have to preface it by saying, look, I'm, if we're going by Frater UD's models of magic, I consider myself pretty hard on the psych model. Like, psych, information, spirit, energy. Like, everybody has a meta model after, you know, even a few months of learning about this shit. You never stay one hardline model as as by the, the UD layout, but like, I have to make sure that it's very clear that this is how I personally see magic. That's why I'm describing these things the way I see them. I mean, and I'm going to hit up a bunch of other people in the community for, you know, error checking and suggestions and contributions within their model so that as many of the broad ranging models are, are you know, represented. Mm-hmm. Because I don't want it to be like, oh, well, I read this book and then indoctrinate them all into the psych model when they might personally do better with, with something else, another framework. Spirit model team over here. Yo, yo. <laughs> Actually, but even then, I do hybrid, right? Like, it's not like I ever strictly work spirit model. Like, as much as I do work with spirits, I also psych model the fuck out of stuff all the time because I'm talking about my sub subconscious, mid conscious, like the ego, super ego, and that shit. And it's it really speaks to the um to the evolving nature of magic to to really look at um chaos magicians or chaotis as you call them to kind of go right because nobody really uses like a hard single modeled system and that's why i think the meta model has such a place you know because it's not necessarily a model that has all of them it's a model that takes a bit of the ones that work for you and kind of like goes towards your personal tailored style of magic right well, I mean, magic in itself is a highly subjective practice, and we're surrounded by all of those things all the time, and the way that we interact with reality and our brains interact with reality, even when we're not consciously paying attention, and and I have to qualify that by saying that, that I'm personally of the belief that what we call magic is just another function of reality that we haven't found words for or the science to prove yet, and eventually we might. So mm -hmm. we're surrounded by information. We're surrounded by energy. We're surrounded by things that that seem to stir on the basis of belief, you know, belief alone, like the concept of egregores and servitors and god forms and all these things. And, and we're surrounded by all these things, and we're interpreting through our fucking heads, which is psychology. So, like, the meta model is is basically the only real way to go with this because if you're if you're in it for chaos magic just saying well i'm psych model so this that and the other shoots the entire fucking concept in the face like you're ignoring so much potential you're ignoring so many things you are self-limiting and that's not the point of chaos magic it never was it never will be 
Like, I've been I've been thinking, you know, kind of just listening to you guys just now. Do you guys want to like do like an expanded episode just on chaos magic in general? Because I mean, you're I you're kind of working on this it. book right now, and I would just love to kind of just like hang here in the background, you know, like ask you guys questions, pick your brains a bit, and and I think that would be a make for a really cool episode. Because our last one wasn't really about chaos magic; it was more just about DKMU specifically. Mm -hmm. Um. So, Sophia, do you want to do our intro and then you guys can just keep running on this topic here? Yeah, I mean, if that's the topic we want to go with for tonight, we can absolutely, like, ride that one, too. Yeah, I'm totally down. I wanted to 